Ladies and gentlemen, it is March 17th, 2024, and we are here to talk about the world. Current events, foreign policy, economics, you name it. We will talk about it in the most bi unbiased, sorry, unbiased way possible. <laughs> if we get anything wrong throughout the show, please leave us a scathing review in the YouTube comments or in the Twitch chat while we're talking. We'll be sure to read that complaint to ourselves and focus on how to be better. Without further ado, we begin with World Discussion with Agent Smith. Smith, Smith. Hello? Yo. Hey. Sorry I got back to you so late. and kind of caught me off guard a little bit. It's okay. There was no forewarning. I didn't tell you a day in advance, so it was kind of day of, hey, can we go early? And you're like, well, sure. Yeah, I should have seen it earlier, but mm. uh, I guess I didn't hear the phone go off. Oh, I have my phone muted to everything. Oh, yeah? I find phones beeping at humans offensive, and they should stop it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll, I don't know. Like, I think it was partly my grandfather from England who really had a hatred of phone calls and the whole phone idea of disrupting the home with its loud racket. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, man, he's a very well-balanced and respectable man who is honestly one of the most Christian and godly people I've ever met. And he was not mean or aggressive about anything, but fucking phones. Like he looked at the phone like he was about to beat it up. It was like, shit. I guess, <laughs> I guess it's okay to dislike the idea of being interrupted and bothered by a phone. And obviously there are some people that we enjoy talking to and so on, but there's so much like garbage phone calls that uh, we have to deal with and garbage messages that we get that aren't even for us. Like I still get messages for people who have uh, collections withholding in Texas and they keep telling me which governor to vote for in Texas, even <laughs> though I don't live there. <laughs> so yeah, fuck the noise from phones. I turn it off for everything except for a few select uh, family and my partner. But aside from that, nobody. Understandable. It doesn't even do pop-ups on my home screen. Oh, That's how fussy fancy. I am. <laughs> yeah, turn all notifications off and give yourself a little bit more peace of mind and quiet. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I've got a little too much of the latter, I guess, because I missed your message by about three hours. That's okay. Were you sleeping? No, I just had my headphones on. I don't always notice the phone vibrating or... Oh, notifying yeah. me when I'm listening to something or playing something or reading something. Mm -hmm. Also, I may have just been out of the room. I've kind of been in and out, mm -hmm. you know, feeding and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. Today's been a heckin' wild day in terms of just humans being aggressive and upset. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had a YouTube commenter who has committed at least eight comments to my channel who firmly believes that because my channel has not grown fast enough over the past 10 years, I should stop business operations today. <laughs> and this is, this is the hill that they're standing on. And it's interesting and weird because most people don't have that of like a random heckler outside is like, you suck, quit your job. You suck at your job, quit, do better stuff. And it's like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, yeah, I heard you talking about that earlier. Yeah. And yeah, some people uh, just need something to do, I guess. Yeah. You know, if uh, you're making money doing something, there's no reason to stop. Yeah. It's not like you're going into debt to do this. True. Yeah, bless Kukio for letting this stream be born. He was like a renaissance man when it came to throwing money at weird tech projects and stuff. So if something mm -hmm. sounded interesting and cool, sure, I'll sponsor that. And that's what a lot of people did uh, back in the day. If you were an affluent aristocrat and you just had a bunch of spending money, why would you get another extra fucking barn on your property when you can give some weird inventor the ability to make something that could be really cool and gets you a lot of fame and attention because you sponsored that? So he was definitely of that mind of like, sure, fucking... You want to help people with tilt and mindset on Twitch? I believe in you. Simply putting faith in that. Yeah, being an actual patron. And then with Twitch and these platforms, uh, there's shared patronage too between all the subscribers who keep this stream going. We've held this segment 
on Sundays. This has actually been my longest surviving uh, segment with anyone else over the history of the stream. I don't think I've done a consistent thing for as long as we've done World Discussion. We've been doing this for what, like six years? I'm trying to think. 2017, mid 2017 was when we started. Yeah. Yeah, damn. Yeah, this will be the sixth year. That's pretty sweet. So yeah, just the fact that, that this segment was born because someone believed in us. And he was willing to put down some of his hard-earned money to make it happen because, spoiler alert, I wasn't making any money for like the first year or two of Twitch streaming. Like no dollars. I think by about the second year, I was able to cover groceries. So that was... Um, that was like my contribution whenever I was starting to bring some bread to the table. But he paid for the vast majority of uh, everything. So like rent was fully covered, internet was fully covered. And to him, the logic was, well, if I have this salary and I can afford a two bedroom or a one bedroom, why would I get a one bedroom and just be by myself when I could get a two bedroom? And there's the same internet bill and the rest of the utilities are pretty similar. So yeah, just that that decision to sponsor something that he thought was really cool, I feel like is an energy that a lot of people can get behind because it does give you that direct uh, line of, okay, you know who you're supporting and what is going on. With a lot of fundraising and organizations and stuff, there are so many moving parts and there are so many things the organization does that it's harder to in good faith back stuff knowing that your money is going where you think it's going. Mm. Whereas if you can see what the person is doing and you have that uh, direct line of support, then yeah, it just feels more clean and direct. And you also don't bleed money going through different payment processors or different steps. Like one issue that we have in the current year is uh, music artists make almost no money from online music streaming, even if people play their stuff quite a bit. Like the mid tier, say middle class music artists make nothing from online. They make all their money from shows and merch tables at shows because there are no middle people there. There's no website that's taking a rake and there's no transfer fee that's taking a rake and all that kind of stuff. So thanks all for the support, it means a lot. Uh, I've decided even after that person's YouTube comments today, I'm not gonna retire. <laughs> so <laughs> if any people were worried about that, yeah, I'm gonna keep streaming, keep doing stuff. So make of that what you will. But yeah, thank you, Kukio, for letting World Discussion be a six to seven year plus segment. May it live forever. Well, thank you for hosting. Hell yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Gives me something to look forward to every week. Hell yeah. It's good for me, too, because I don't uh, naturally pursue news. And also, you're just a nice person to talk to who's, I would say, like, 99 times more level-headed than your average person current year with your tone and stance on things like I feel like a lot of people struggle to find a neutral stance or an even stance when they look at issues because we are aggressively fed outrage media in short form content that doesn't really give us a good picture of what's going on so people run at these conversations with a ton of emotion but without a lot of high quality information which is a, a bummer. So, thank you for giving us your based takes. Well, you know, I, I try to be mellow. In general, that's what I strive to be in most walks of life. But also, I don't think my opinion really carries all that much weight. So, I don't think people really want to want to hear that. I think people prefer just hearing information. That's weird because people who know a lot less than you put a lot of weight in their opinion. So. <laughs> <laughs> True, but that's just all the more reason not to emulate them. Uh, I prefer my own style. His own style. Yeah. Well, the biggest uh, thing that Chad was memeing about before we started, which I didn't see this, but I'm glad they brought it up. Uh, Putin won re-election. <laughs> <laughs> to the surprise of some, maybe, but not very many. Yeah, yeah. And was Chad a, was saying he only got 87% of the vote, which means 13%. They were uh, they were well, choosing most, other options. 
most of that would have been going to uh, political parties that are, were actually created by uh, either the government or people affiliated with the government. So there were no true opposition figures that were actually allowed to run. Mm. Yeah, they, you know, they used to be pretty smart about that. Like, there was a guy named, um, what was it? I think his name was Surikov. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but uh, he was sort of the mastermind of uh, managed democracy, as they call it in Russia. And it was this idea that uh, Russia would still have elections, but that the political parties running uh, would all be either directly or indirectly controlled by a sort of central authority. So people would have the illusion of choice. Uh, they would still have choice, but it would just not be like a real choice. You know, they were always going to be stuck with the Putin regime in some form, but they would have the opportunity to voice discontent and preference for a potential alternative. Uh, approaches to governance uh, by voting for one of the sort of pre-designed, pre-made political parties that were made available to them in elections. And, you know, they, they did have a variety of options in that sense. You know, they created a fake liberal party for people who wanted the government, who wanted to vote in a way that would signal that they wanted relatively more liberal governance. Uh, they kind of co-opted the liberal Democrats who are Contrary to what the name sounds, a far-right ultranationalist party. <laughs> so, you know, people who wanted that could vote for that. Uh, they co-opted the Communist Party, so, you know, that was another option. Uh, more recently, they came up with... Uh, well, I think Just Russia was, like, the fake liberal alternative. And I think there's another liberal alternative they were created for this election. I forget what the name is. Uh, but that's uh, sort of the new variant of Just Russia. So, you know, they, they did kind of go out of the way to create some different options. But after 2011, it became much more obvious. <laughs> like before 2011, uh, they worked harder to pretend that they were actual alternative options. But since then, they've more or less dropped the facade. And it's kind of an open secret that, you know, voting for one of these parties is tantamount uh, to voting for Putin. And just part of a general slide away from the uh, illiberal democracy, as they call it, that Russia used to be, and towards the explicitly authoritarian Russia that we have right now. There was a kind of transitory period starting with 2011 up until a couple years ago, during which that old system broke down. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not broke down, but was broken down uh, by the authorities. Yeah, I don't know enough about Russian politics to know why exactly that happened. In general, my impression was that the government was spooked by the uh, protests around uh, the 2011 election. When Putin won, you know, he won the election, but he didn't win it by as much. It was like 60 to 70 percent instead of circa 80 percent. And so that had the government a little concerned about legitimacy and the response, uh, rather than trying to what's the word I want, address the public's concerns, which were legitimate, they instead went the opposite direction and just started cracking down. Mm. And they've been trending in that direction ever since. Uh, I think part of it also has to do with the change in, uh, what's the word? Entourage, shall we, say, shall, we, shall we say. You know, the people in Putin's inner circle have changed over time. So guys like uh, Surikov, and also Kudrin, who was kind of the economic equivalent. He was a uh, Kudrin was a guy who believed in economic reform, but he knew that there would be limits given uh, the necessities and requirements of maintaining Putin's patronage network. So, within the constraints of what was possible, he pushed economic reform and was generally pretty good at it. So, guys like Surikov and Kudrin before 2011 were much more prominent, and then after 2011. They, got, they both got pushed to the margins, along with a lot, a lot of other more moderate type figures. And uh, the guys that ascended in their stead tended to be a lot more hawkish, a lot more militaristic, and a lot more authoritarian. Uh, a lot of them have been people who were former bodyguards for Vladimir Putin. Hmm. Uh, he generally trusts them a lot. And you know, in an authoritarian system, loyalty is uh, of paramount importance if you are sort of the leader 
uh, you know, you need to know that the people under you aren't going to make a move against you, and the more loyal, the better in that sense. So a lot of his former bodyguards ended up getting promoted into positions like governors. Uh, they got put on the board of directors on state-owned companies, you know, a lot of stuff like that. And uh, you can kind of see the shift in approach to governance as those people ascended. And I, I suspect that there's a pretty strong linkage there. Would you like to choose one of our other government curated options for election this year? <laughs> we have a liberal option, a conservative option, and an ultra-nationalist option. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Don't forget the communists. Yeah. They're still out there. A communist option. Did we talk about Navalny? Uh, no. You know what happened to him? What happened to him? He's dead. He's dead? Yeah. We don't know exactly what happened, but I mean, everybody kind of just assumes it's that he got murdered. Oh, didn't this happen like a few months ago? I think yeah, I well, this. not a few months. I think it was like a month and change ago, thereabouts. Uh -huh. It's been a while. Uh -huh. Yeah, we we kind of been skipping over it, but uh, I mean, it's not necessarily a big shock that he died. I mean, I think everybody kind of knew he was more or less living on borrowed time, but. Uh, you know, for Russians, especially, uh, specifically like relatively liberal Russians, it was pretty shocking. Mm -hmm. You know, he had been sort of the the face of Russian liberalism and the Russian opposition for what, like more than ten years or so. And uh, there was kind of an implicit assumption that, you know, even if the government would, you know, oppress him, maybe occasionally try to murder him that maybe he uh, would somehow find a way through and that eventually Russia would modernize and Navalny would play a more prominent role in politics. But you know, that's not going to happen now. And a lot of people were really upset about it. Hmm. Yeah, he had been in a, uh, what do you call it? Like a penal colony, mm -hmm. like in the far north. They put him in one of those. And then for a, a penal colony, that's jail, not dicks, right? <laughs> correct. Okay, just want to clarify. That would that would be correct. Uh, conditions were pretty bad, and he was not in the best shape. Uh, but it doesn't seem likely that it was natural causes. It could have been, given how bad conditions were. But you know, he had been. There was a video released of him. But just like a week or two before he died and he seemed to be doing all right so the fact that he just kind of drops dead in prison is a bit suspicious and it's even more suspicious that it happened what only about a month before the election happened so, you know a lot of people are just a lot of people think the government finally just decided to get rid of them to send a signal mm -hmm. So yeah, the guys that actually do want a change in Russia, like the genuine legitimate opposition, they're having a pretty hard time right now. You know, Navalny was killed. There were two opposition candidates that tried to run for president, but were not allowed. Uh, they were literally not given permission to be on the ballot. So uh, yeah, government's kind of dropping the hammer right now, hmm. much more thoroughly so than they did before. So we're very much in a new authoritarian Russia. Do you think it's because state. they're in wartime or? Um, I would not agree with you for the simple reason that this is on trend. Oh. This is part of a trend that predates the war. So yeah, the war definitely accelerated the trend a bit, but at the same time, the government was already making moves like this before then. Uh, they just weren't as dramatic before. You know, again, it was kind of a slow transitory period uh, from 2011 up until a few years ago when they were slowly becoming more and more openly authoritarian. They didn't do it all in one jump, uh, but you could see it gradually happening as they made changes here and there that made the political system less competitive, uh, that shut down non-government organizations, that shut down and marginalized political opposition. You know, the space for criticism of the government has been shrinking pretty steadily over time. Uh, even, so all of this was even before the war. So when the war happened, the government cracked down. And since then, uh, yeah, it's definitely gotten worse. But all of that was just part of a general drift in that direction anyway. And it's likely that they would have ended up in the same place regardless, maybe just uh, 
uh, it would have taken a little longer without the war. Hmm. Hmm. Not very fair and free elections, it sounds like. Well. So. Yeah. So I guess it's just status quo then with uh, re-election, 87%, oh, yeah. everything kind of went according to plan. For uh, sure. Yeah, the government's doing fine. They're sitting pretty. And, uh, Moscow is pretty comfortable with its position within Russian politics right now. How has Russia been doing economically, being cut off and stuff? I don't know, pretty robust. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's kind of that had been what I was reading before the war started. That if there was a war, sanctions would not have too big of an impact. There was a period in the like the first month or so of the war when it looked like actually it may have dramatic impact. You know, certainly there was a lot of uh, scrambling on the part of the Russian government uh, once the central bank's assets were seized. Uh, but after that, things kind of stabilized, and it's been more or less okay since then. There's been higher inflation, but not too high. You know, it's still pretty manageable. Uh, the central bank has managed the you know shock and dislocation of losing so many of its assets, and it's been doing a decent enough job of managing uh, capital controls and interest rates uh, that the currency is still relatively stable. Every so often, it'll have a big swing, uh, but it's not collapsed either. So that's holding steady. Uh, Overall employment is actually up and output is actually up. Uh, so, you know, if you just look at the macro data, it actually looks like the Russian economy is doing somewhat better uh, than it was before the war. And so that's got a lot of critics of uh, Ukraine and Western support for Ukraine, you know, uh, chortling about, you know, the inefficacy of sanctions and the inability and stupidity uh, of Western support for Ukraine and the lack of any coherent plan there. But that's also not an entirely fair reading. Um, yes, the Russian economy in macro terms is doing better, uh, but there are underlying pressures there. Uh, for one, the main reason that the Russian economy is growing at this point is because of defense spending. That's the main driver right now of the Russian economy. And, you know, that's the old guns and butter trade off in economics, right? You know, you can spend money on guns, but the opportunity cost there is all the money you could have spent on butter, butter referring to things like uh, public spending or maybe tax cuts, you know, getting money back in the pockets of citizens. And, uh, you know, when you, spend th when you spend things on society, either by uh, lower taxes or with public investment, you're getting a return there because all of that is for the good over the long run. You know, that improves overall economic conditions over the long run. But defense spending doesn't do that, you know. Uh, when you spend money on a tank, a bullet, a plane, a missile, that's a sunk cost, right? You know, you're not getting that money back. You know, you use it, and it's gone forever. And that's not to say that military spending is not useful. Obviously, if you're fighting a war, uh, that can be that can be a net positive if you're able to win the war and avoid some kind of catastrophic invasion. But that's not really what Russia's encountering right now. It's not. Uh, a war of survival for Russia. This is very much a war of choice. So, you know, if Russia loses, it's going to be fine, you know, almost certainly. So the stakes then economically are pretty low if they lose. Uh, so the opportunity cost for all of this heightened defense spending is pretty high. Like all of this is spending that, that could have been going into education uh, or in the private sector, it could have been directed into capital investment. Uh, you know, in general, in the guns and butter comparison, uh, capital investment is generally the alternative to weapons that economists look at. So if you invest in factory machinery, that machinery produces other stuff for people over the lifespan of the machinery. And so by contrast, when you invest in, you know, again, military equipment, you're not getting that. You know, the tank doesn't produce bread for people to eat, doesn't produce hentai for people to use on the internet. You know, it's not producing useful stuff for people to consume. It's just producing death. And again, there are circumstances when that can be useful, but in general, economically speaking, it's not. You know, you're missing out on all of the stuff that that capital, that hypothetical capital that you could have been spending on would have produced. And so in that sense, not only is there a big long-term cost, 
to buying lots of military equipment, uh, that cost actually compounds over time. Because all of the money you could have been making with the stuff that that machinery you hypothetically could have invested in, uh, all of that money could have then been turned around and further invested in new capital. And then money made from that capital could have been invested in further capital. So uh, there is a compounding opportunity cost over time, which can be like very dramatic when you estimate it over the long run. So economists are pretty down on military spending in general, you know, uh, beyond yeah, an unreasonable amount anyway. Obviously, you're always going to have some. But Russia is pretty well beyond that point now, like a big chunk of their economy, certainly a big chunk of their economic growth at this at this juncture is just military spending. And the civilian economy in turn is getting crowded out. Like a lot of, uh, what would you say, uh, a lot of uh, capital in the country. When I say capital here, I'm referring more to investment rather than machinery. So, you know, the savings of the country uh, are being directed towards investment in uh, the defense industrial base in order to scale up production for the war. Uh, but that money could have been spent on civilian capital, and right now it's not. And there's been uh, a noticeable decline, uh, not only investment, not only in investment in the civilian sector, but also in civilian production. And uh, right now it's not that noticeable because there's so much employment being generated for defense industries. Uh, but you know, hypothetically the war will end at some point. And at that point, uh, the Russian government may find it very difficult to resurrect the civilian economy. Because uh, there's not necessarily going to be, well, I shouldn't say that. I should say there's not going to be as much of a civilian economy left by the end of the war given that it's probably going to last for several more years. It's, I don't think anybody thinks it's going to end this year, for example. I think everybody knows that uh, both sides of the war are waiting to see how the U.S. presidential election plays out. So, like, bare minimum, the war is going to last through November of this year. But almost certainly it'll last beyond that, regardless of outcome. So, you know, at the very least, the war ends, like, 2026 at the earliest. So it's, it's going to be a while. And so for the Russian economy... Uh, that means that in so much as the war is having a detrimental impact on the civilian economy, uh, it's going to continue to degrade for some time, probably two more years at least. Hmm. Interesting that yeah. the U.S. election matters that much for it, but it makes sense with uh, funding. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, we play a big role in that regard, along with the Europeans. Yeah, one of the uh, unintended side effects of the war... Uh, is that the automotive market in Russia is increasingly dominated by Chinese producers. Because Western producers aren't selling in Russia at this point, at least not directly. Uh, you, actually, you actually still can buy Western cars in Russia, uh, but they have to be basically imported from third-party countries. You know, so people will buy them in like Kazakhstan, for example, or Turkey, uh, and then they'll sell them on to Russians. And uh, because sanctions on Russia do not yet include secondary sanctions, that is still technically legal right now. So Russians can still get them, but they do cost a bit more on account of the additional middleman in the process. And also I've read that uh, car parts are especially more expensive, specifically car parts for like Western cars and whatnot. Uh, sanctions are impacting them particularly hard, apparently. Hmm. And uh, middlemen in the re-export trade are charging like premium prices for them. So, you know, inflation for Western imported goods is definitely a factor. You see that much more so than inflation for Russian made goods. Uh, you know, so maybe <laughs> people like Tucker Carlson are perhaps unaware, but you know, Russia is a major agricultural producer. Uh, Russia produces most of its own food and is actually a net exporter of things like grain in which it actually has a comparative advantage. So it, it should not really be surprising to people that, yes, Russia does in fact have food. That, that's something that they're pretty good at. And so the things that Russia produces on its own, those are still fairly affordable. I think there's been some inflation, uh, but it's been pretty mild. It's much less than the inflation for things like, you know, a Mercedes Benz, for example, or some other like uh, finished Western good of whatever kind. Yeah, actually, there's been a boom in real estate in Russia, uh, partly on the back of a lot of 
you know, partly on the back of a lot of elites and wealthy in Russia not being able to travel freely to Europe. You know, obviously there's uh, more restrictions there than there used to be. And so a lot of those people who used to take their discretionary funds and spend it on vacations in places like, you know, Western Europe or what have you, they're staying in Russia now uh, more and more. And so more and more of that money then is ending, ending up in uh, Russian tourism. tourism. And so there's been more investment in locales like that that specialize in tourism. Uh, there's also been a housing boom. You know, more people have been investing in housing, again, partly because they can't as easily invest abroad, which is normally what Russians had uh, done with their savings. Well, Russians who had significant enough savings anyway uh, to invest in property historically have tended to invest them in uh, property outside of Russia. But that's not as po possible now. So there's been a bump there in housing prices. And so that's actually encouraged production of new housing, you know, concurrently. So uh, that is one part of the private sector that's actually doing pretty well uh, beyond just military spending. The housing sector has been pretty robust. And of course, that has a lot of homeowners pretty happy. You know, homeowners always like it when the, the value of their home goes up because that's more money in their pocket, so to speak. So, you know, it's not just that the economy is robust. It's also that people in Russia tend to feel that it's actually doing pretty well. Uh, specifically for these reasons that I've out, that I've outlined. Hmm. So that's doing fine. The downside, for the most part, is that having been cut off from imports from the West, especially for uh, strategic complex machinery, uh, the toll on uh, Russian industry is going to grow over time. Uh, right now, they're kind of hobbling along on smuggling. You know, lots of stuff that is not supposed to go to Russia. Uh, that is to say, stuff that has been sanctioned is still able to get through uh, using the same, you know, sorts of uh, mechanisms that I described with regard to the private sector economy. Um, a lot of the people that legally engage in re-export also engage in illegal re-export of sanctioned goods bought from the West. And right now, the West has been pretty bad at trying to address that problem. Uh, part of that is reluctance on the part of Europe because their economy is a little wobbly right now and they're not especially interested in adding additional pressure. Uh, for the United States, there's just more of a lack of will in that regard. Uh, I would point out, too, that Europe has a, lot, a lack of capacity to enforce secondary sanctions. Um, the United States government, despite being more laissez-faire, is actually much larger and has more capacity to administrate things like secondary sanctions. Uh, Europe, by contrast, does not. You know, I've seen it commented that uh, the agencies in the United States responsible for enforcing things like sanctions and export restrictions are way, way larger, uh, you know, encompassing multiple agencies, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people, whereas the European equivalents are maybe a couple of guys, <laughs> you know, much smaller. They don't have nearly as much bureaucracy to work with, and that gives them a very narrow bandwidth. Uh, through which to enforce those. So that's another problem from Europe's end. Like they just, part of the reason they have not applied secondary sanctions yet is they just don't really have the means to enforce or administrate it. You know, if they did do it, they would almost certainly end up dependent on the United States to oversee it. So what that means is that uh, Russian industry has still been able to get advanced equipment, uh, software, you know, whatever it is they need, replacement parts, et cetera. All of that stuff is still getting through, not as much as getting through as uh, obviously when sanctions were not present. Uh, so there is still a cost being added. You know, middlemen charge their premium there. So it's more expensive and the volume is lower. So there has been an impact, uh, but Russian industry has still been able to expand production uh, because of smuggling. However, over the long run, sanctions presumably will be tightened and also Russian industry, especially in the private sector, is going to find it increasingly difficult uh, to maintain their equipment. Uh, Chinese alternatives exist, but in general, Chinese alternatives are not nearly as advanced or competitive. Uh, in general, Western machinery leads multiple markets uh, as far as capital investment goes. So that's gonna be like a 10, 20 year problem for the Russian economy, assuming the sanctions last that long. Uh, competitiveness will fall, productivity will fall, wages will fall, and uh, the diversity of the overall economy will, will correspondingly fall if the civilian economy is subjected to those kinds of prolonged sanctions.
smuggling will help them mitigate the impact, but the impact is still going to be there regardless. You know, it's a global economy, and if you're constantly getting hobbled by sanctions, it's going to be very difficult for you to have top of the line stuff. And if you can't make top of if you can't make investments in top of the line machinery, you're just not going to be competitive. Uh, maybe with subsidies from the government, you could mute some of that, but uh, it's unclear if the Russian, you know, the Russian government is going to have that money in the future. Because uh, it's not just oil money that is floating the Russian budget right now, it's also borrowing. You know, the Chinese government almost certainly is helping with that to some degree. Uh, how sustainable that is, is an open question, you know, because the Russian government is not entirely open about its finances for obvious reasons. So there's a trade-off, uh, you know, long story short, there's gonna be a long-term cost uh, in terms of Russian competitiveness, especially in the private sector. The gain in the short term is a much more robust and productive defense industrial base that is going to be able to pump out lots of vehicles, ammunition, guns, etc. cetera. Uh, still not clear if they're going to be able to produce enough of what they need. You know, overall production of things like tanks, for example, is still relatively low. And, uh, you know, they lost thousands of vehicles in the opening months of the war. So, you know, they're not going to replace that for like five to 10 years. That's the losses were just so massive that uh, it doesn't matter how much Russia invests in their defense industrial base. It's going to take a long time to replace all of that. Uh, so in terms of just attrition, Russia's defense base can't keep up with Ukraine and, you know, and the demands of the war. Uh, they're going to be able to do some. You know, again, they have significantly ramped up production, uh, but keep in mind that significantly ramping up production from a relatively low base isn't necessarily saying much. And that kind of brings me to another important aspect of this question, uh, which is that, again, as Ukrainians themselves have repeatedly pointing out and that I feel Westerners keep forgetting, the war didn't really start in 2022. It actually started in 2014. And that's significant because 2014 is actually when the first tranche, so to speak, of Western sanctions were applied to Russia. And they were pretty middling sanctions overall. You know, they were not that significant. But the thing is that the Russian government noted at the time uh, that if the conflict with Ukraine continued, as they obviously expected it would, then sanctions would get worse. And so Russian government policy after 2014 was to go out of its way uh, to try to make the Russian economy as robust to Western sanctions as possible. So it's not as though the Russian economy was just operating normally uh, in the lead up to the war in Ukraine in 2022. Um, it was already subject to some sanctions and more to the point, it was subject uh, to a lot of controls and restrictions imposed by the Russian government that were designed to mitigate dependence on Western markets. Now, obviously, Russia is not self-sufficient in a lot of stuff, so there's only there was only so much the Russian government could do in that regard. Uh, but it was a successful effort in so much as it muted the immediate impact, well, the medium-term impact, rather, of Western sanctions in 2022. You know, if the Russian economy is doing decent in the face of sanctions right now, it's partly because the Russian government spent the better part of 10 years designing it to do that, starting with 2014. Yeah, in so much as there was dislocation in the first month of the war, that was because even the Russian government had not expected uh, the assets of its central bank to be seized. That was a dramatic move on the part of uh, the West, uh, specifically the United States. That was seen as like a pretty dramatic reaction in financial terms. You know, that's not that was considered almost a breach of sovereignty. Uh, that's just how much of it. Uh, that's just how much of a violation that was. So that caught them off guard, and that's part of the reason there was so much discord and scrambling in Russian financial markets in the first couple of months, uh, to the point where people were saying that sanctions were going to crush the economy. You know, that was never going to be the case, uh, given how robust they were and had been designed to be. But certainly, that extra move at the start, you know, that unanticipated move, gave the impression that maybe it would. Yeah, I feel like one of the advantages that Russia has and that other large countries do that insulates them against sanctions hurting them is a large amount of land mass and a large number of climates that they have within their continent or within their nation. So Russia has a huge expanse of land, which means some of it, yeah, is, is kind of cold, but a lot of it is good farmland and so on. 
so they don't really need to go outside of that range to have everything that a nation needs whereas for something like the uk where they're more local and they don't have as many resources just on the island themselves Mm -hmm. it could hurt them more Uh, the u.s is very self-sufficient in that sense and that's one of the reasons why we had an edge in world war ii of ramping up production we just had a ton of defensible land that's really far from everyone else so we're free to ramp up our businesses and stuff without needing to defend all of that because you have less surface area exposure from attack when you have a huge land mass relative to the places your people can live china as well is large enough and has enough climates and stuff that doesn't really need other countries as much to keep itself going at this point they do but historically i feel like yeah you you have a good point you know large land mass and productive land does definitely play a role there uh but keep in mind that you know russia is big in the same way that a, a poodle is big you know they seem bigger than they are because of all the fur you get them wet they look a lot smaller hmm. you know russia's kind of similar if you want an example of what i'm talking about here i don't know are you in game right now no so run a google image search for russian population density map and it'll show you where uh the population centers in the country are and what you'll see is that as big as russia is almost all of the people either live in the western part of the country or in a very narrow band uh, that runs along the southern part of Siberia. So it's a big country, but it doesn't have that many people. You know, in terms of uh, people per square kilometer, Russia does not have very much at all. Mm-hmm. So while they do have a lot of land, they have a somewhat limited capacity to exploit all of it. Uh, in terms, like you know, like I said before, in terms of agricultural produce, they do fine, uh, and in terms of mining, they do fine. Uh, but there's a lot more to Russia. Uh, than what they currently produce that they could be producing if they have more people. And uh, I would point out, too, that one of the issues that Russia has, you know, regard, and this is something that uh, is irrelevant to the size of the country, is just the manufacturing sector. You know, the uh, Russian industrial base took a big hit at the end of the Cold War and it never really recovered. And so, you know, you can be as big a country as you want, but if you can't build a modern competitive manufacturing sector, Uh, you're still going to be very dependent on trade, both in terms of exporting uh, raw materials uh, to raise the money you need to buy modern finished goods, and also in terms of uh, being dependent on imports of those goods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Russia does have some manufacturing capacity left over from the Cold War, but they've lost a lot of expertise, a lot of capacity. You know, I was reading earlier in the war that they had basically lost the expertise necessary to build uh, barrels for tanks. You know, that was something that they just didn't do for a long time after the Cold War ended, and a lot of the people that had that expertise ended up leaving. So, you know, when uh, Russia did its big military buildup, you know, kind of uh, late aughts, early teens, uh, a lot of that depended either on the importation of modern machinery, uh, a lot of which was computer controlled. You know, uh, hi- historically, Soviet industry was largely like human human led like even by the end of the cold war uh when western machinery was increasingly automated you know either robots or uh computer operated i guess the cnc is computer numerical control so that's the type of machinery i'm thinking here the russians didn't really have that even by the end of the cold war for the most part and uh so when they lost the people that were actually working the equivalent machinery in russia like they lost those skills for good, like they didn't have any capacity to really recover from that. And so they became dependent on the importation of CNC machinery from the West. Uh, so depending on that machinery or you know, in lieu of the machinery, just importing the parts that they needed from the West, which they also did uh, for a long time, they were still heavily dependent on Western producers. And you know, I'm, think, I'm talking here more in terms of the defense base, but the same is true in the civilian base, like a lot of automotive companies in the Soviet Union that survived into the Russian Federation and the creation thereof, you know, a lot of them had a really hard time adjusting to the market and ended up only surviving uh, by making deals with Western automotive companies, uh, wherein they would cooperate on sharing uh, manufacturing facilities, access to the market, etc. You know, obviously the Russian firms knew the market better than the foreigners did. So the foreigners uh, would make a deal wherein they would give the design of the car uh, the plans, whatnot, and they would also send them the parts to make the car, 
and uh, the Russian partner would assemble the car in Russia and then would be, and then would be responsible uh, for marketing and selling it uh, in the Russian market. So that, by and large, is how most Russian automotive firms survived through the 90s and then through the aughts and even into the teens when they were on much more stable footing, uh, they still maintained those cooperative agreements with Western firms. And it's really only been since 2022 and the war in Ukraine when those partnerships have started to break down, since obviously uh, Western automotive firms have been withdrawing from the market, either because of sanctions or because they're concerned over the potential risk uh, of losing money if sanctions are extended to the automotive sector. Interesting. Okay, I have the map of Russia. I googled it and then the match was found. I couldn't cancel it, but I got the image in time. And we still won the game, chat. All right, population density map of Russia. This is population per kilometer squared sourced from Reddit, which everyone knows is probably true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're looking at this. Yellow is nobody's there. Uh, dark blue is the highest population density. So I'm guessing this is Moscow right here. A lot of stuff around it. The biggest clump maybe this is st petersburg not sure just guessing um yeah all this stuff in the north is basically like siberia frozen wasteland there are very small numbers of humans there but nothing like major industry unless there's like a oil base or something probably yeah one of the largest nickel mines in the world is up in the russian arctic sort of in the more westerly area so they do have mines, some oil extraction and whatnot up there, mm -hmm. but that's about it. There's really not much else. Mm -hmm. This is a reasonably big area here, this city. It's in this uh, really far east. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, almost certainly the capital. The capital of this province or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And there's yeah, the this capital is a... Go ahead. There's this football shaped thing that's uh, next to Korea and whatnot, where there's one city, but it's not very heavily populated. It just, mm -hmm. it just takes so long to get from the more densely populated west side of the country to the eastern side of the country. Mm -hmm. It's a very horizontal landmass. But yeah, I think a lot of what we're talking about when it's the farming output is all in this uh southwest corner well also southern siberia that's also very productive in terms of grain production hmm. cool. yeah that belt of uh, population density you see going into the east mm -hmm. that's almost all grain production oh. with some mining throw in thrown in yeah, central southern south central siberia is a pretty interesting area because it's almost self-sufficient in most of the stuff it needs. It uh, produces a lot of grain, like I said, uh, but there's also a basin, I think it's called Novo Kuznets, if I'm not mistaken, that has a lot of uh, mining, I think specifically coal and iron production. So that's a big center of metallurgy. Hmm. And then the city of Novosibirsk, Novosibirsk, never figured out how to pronounce that that's a city in the same region i'm talking about and that's a, a big uh, center for academia so there's a lot of universities and whatnot there hmm. so you know you've got you've got primary sector with the grain you've got secondary sector with some of the metallurgy and other manufacturing and then you got education for the tertiary sector so you know there's a decent amount going on in south central siberia you just never hear it talked about because Nobody ever goes there, and it's not well integrated into the global economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be basically something that Russia basically consumes itself, so there isn't as much talk about it outside yeah. of that. That makes sense. And then there's a decent bit on this very uh, southern easternmost portion in South Siberia, which this juts next to which... Countries oh, you mean the, like the Far East? Yeah, Far East. Far oh, Southeast. yeah, that's 
yeah, generally that's referred to as the Russian Far East, and that's it's kind of part of Siberia, but it's also kind of not. It's generally treated as its own region. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're talking about is next to China, specifically northeastern China, a region historically called Manchuria. Mm -hmm. um, it's a region that they actually stole during, I think, the Second Opium War. Yeah, China was fighting with the British and the French in the Second Opium War. And because the Chinese government was busy, the Russian government took the opportunity to lean on the Chinese to give them territorial concessions, uh, which the Chinese government did not feel it could oppose. So the result is that Russia got that territory you're talking about there in the Far East. Huh. Yeah, it's a little more, the climate there is more mild. And so it's got some more people there and uh, it's got some better soil. So there was more colonization. Also, they built a big naval base there in Vladivostok, and so there was a lot. There was a lot of uh, government economic, government-related economic activity there that boosted the population. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm just zooming in on this on the map. Yeah, you're right. It almost goes to North Korea. It actually does. It's got a very oh, narrow border with North Korea. Nice. I'm pulling it up on Google Maps. So I can see the cities as well as the population density. Yeah, I see it. Vladivostok right here. Yeah, they actually built a rail line through that border. Huh. So a lot of the uh, North Korean ammunition <laughs> that the North Korean government agreed to give Russia recently for use in the Ukraine war probably went through that railway. Hmm. Interesting. Russia's yeah, the Russians... got a lot of history to it. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I think a lot of the regional history is virtually unknown in the West. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of Russian history that people in the West know about is sort of the highlights. You know, you know about uh, the Napoleonic Wars and how Napoleon invaded Russia. You know about World War One, World War Two. you know, stuff like that. Maybe some of the arts, you know, the literature and whatnot. Uh, but as far as like uh, the history uh, and unique aspects of specific regions in Russia, like nobody knows shit about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the Russian Far East is really interesting because uh, even Moscow, like, doesn't really believe it's part of Russia. <laughs> you know, it's it's all an integral part of Russia politically speaking. But like, uh, for example, during the Russian Civil War. And uh, even after, into the 1920s and 30s, there was some expectation, more so in the 1920s, I should say, there was some expectation in Moscow that uh, the new Soviet government would not be able to retain the Russian Far East. And that was not considered a price too high uh, in order to preserve the revolution. You know, keep in mind that during much of the Russian Civil War and a couple years after, a good chunk of the Russian Far East was actually occupied by Japan which is another story you don't hear much about. Uh, it costed Japan something like half of its national budget to maintain that occupation, but it was considered such a unique opportunity to expand that the Japanese government thought it was worthwhile, but eventually they just couldn't maintain it anymore and ended up withdrawing. Uh, but that's why, or at least partly why, uh, the Russian government didn't think they could hold on to the Russian Far East uh, in the revolutionary period. You know, they just didn't have the resources to really contest it. Mm. And they were much more focused on trying to consolidate control over the parts of Russia where most of the people lived and where most of the industry was, which was, of course, considered far more important. And even once they regained control over the Russian Far East, a lot of the governors in the region were relatively more autonomous than in other parts of Russia. You know, the more built up parts of Russia were considered more important, so they got more attention and the governors were on a much shorter leash. Uh, but in the Far East, hardly anybody lived there and it was really far away. So people could get away with more out there. And so the result is that there was more experimentation in terms of, in terms of economic management. You know, there were still some rudimentary markets that were allowed to operate in the Russian Far East during the Soviet, during the Stalinist period. Uh, to a degree that you did not see in the rest of the Soviet Union. 
And part of that was practicality on the part of Moscow, too, because a good chunk of their foreign exchange that was earned in the 1920s and 30s came from the export of raw materials from the Russian Far East, uh, especially gold, uh, much of which was mined by, you know, slave labor, people working in gulags. Uh, but all the same, you know, ensuring the steady flow of those resources and the sale of those resources uh, was partly the responsibility of regional governments. And uh, they, of course, went out of their way to ensure some market activity could happen and to maintain links with market forces outside the Soviet Union in order to ensure the Soviet government could continue to access uh, that foreign exchange. So they kind of lived in their own little world, even during the Soviet Union. It kind of sounds like a Wild West, but for them, it's a Wild East. Well, that's that's exactly what it is. You know, I've seen Russians make the comparison that it's kind of like their California, mm -hmm. right? It's something that's on the other side of the country and that kind of lives in its own world and does its own thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the difference is California's economy is insane. I don't know if Eastern Russia is quite the same as that. Oh, not even remotely. <laughs> it's all natural resources out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and they still have the naval base, so you know that's also economically relevant. But no, they they do not have California's economic dynamism or diversity, not by a long shot. But politically speaking, and uh, maybe to a lesser degree, culturally speaking, there are parallels. Mm -hmm. You know, politically, in so much as it's far away historically, and hasn't traditionally been that central to the country. California, more central over the past 20 to 30 years. But keep in mind, California was a solidly Republican state for most of its history. And it had a relatively small population until World War II. It grew very rapidly after that, but it took a while for it to become politically competitive. So, you know, we think of it as being a major economic force unto itself, but that's a relatively recent phenomena. Mm -hmm. So the Russian Far East has more in common with, let's say, pre-World War II California. Gotcha. That makes sense. The analogies are much stronger there. Well, cool. Learn more about uh, Russia. I was talking with family, and they were saying uh, that Zelensky was doing stuff like he's canceled elections or delayed elections due to being in wartime yeah yeah the elections have been delayed it's not gonna happen they're not like us neuro <laughs> the united states doesn't cancel elections we have them regardless of circumstances mm -hmm. we had elections through the american civil war which was pretty wild but you know they did it anyway it's just mm -hmm. that important uh but over in europe they don't they don't do things like that they're they're a little more flexible you know, if they're fighting an existential war, they'll delay elections. They can wait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's a common sense move from the perspective of Ukraine and the Ukrainian government. But critics of Ukraine have taken the opportunity to point out uh, the incongruence between Ukraine as a paragon of liberal democracy and the fact that they're basically canceling elections. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very fair criticism to my mind, but... You know, that's the internet for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, I do have, we haven't talked about it in Ukraine for a while, so we do have a backlog there if you're interested. Yeah, let's get a bit of it. I do need to wrap it around, I think, nine your time. It's around my nine nine. o'clock. Okay. Yeah. No, oh, so we still got some time. Yeah, we got plenty of time. Okay. Well, gosh, where do we start here? Uh, let's see. So Wall Street Journal newsletter that I get talked about uh, Russia getting Starlink. That had been something that Ukraine had mostly done. Uh, they got a whole bunch of Starlink devices from uh, Elon Musk for free, basically, although it didn't turn out to actually be free. Actually, the federal government of the US was paying for it. Uh, but from the Ukrainian perspective, they got a whole bunch of free stuff uh, from Starlink. And so that was an advantage for them uh, through the early, what, th for the, through the first two years of the war, let's say. Uh, but now Russia is increasingly deploying them as well. And so that has some people sniping at, you know, Starlink and whatnot, asking them how, how its devices are ending up in Russia. Uh, 
and whether or not they should be uh, preventing the Russians from using them. And so, you know, the answer to both questions, uh, well, the answer to these questions is that one, uh, Russia is getting them any way it can. You know, we talked before about all of the smuggling happening. So a device as small and commercially available as Starlink is definitely going to be very easy to smuggle. So no surprise that the Russians have been able to get them. In terms of denying service, that's possible, but it would be very difficult to deny service to the Russians without also denying service to the Ukrainians using Starlink. Because, you know, they're both using them in the same area. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a front line to the war. So everybody using Starlink is using them in roughly the same geography. And uh, just the way the technical side of it works out, Starlink can't deny service to like specific people in an area without denying it to everybody in that area. Gotcha. So it comes down to a cost benefit. Like, is it uh, more useful for Ukraine to continue to have access to Starlink, uh, even if Russia continues to have access, or is it better for Ukraine to just deny access to everybody, including themselves? So the way the Ukrainians talk about it, they say it's better to have it, even if the Russians also have it. And so most likely Starlink is not going to just shut down services in eastern Ukraine. So there was some chatter about that a while ago, uh, but that does show the degree to which the Russian military has been adapting. You know, adaptation in the Russian military was under question in the first couple year, in the first couple months of the war, uh, but they have shown a continuing ability to adapt. So you know they can do that. They're doing it pretty slowly. It's still not as good as it could be, uh, but they are making improvements here and there over time. So they're hardly stagnant in that regard. Uh, in terms of mobilization, it doesn't look like Russia is making a big effort to mobilize more people. Uh, I think last I checked, they had about like 300K in Ukraine at this point, which I think is roughly as many as the Ukrainian military has. Uh, and it doesn't look like they're going to try to build, it doesn't look like they're going to try to deploy a whole lot more. Uh, from what I was reading, uh, Russian recruitment is at a level that is enough to match attrition, but not more than that. So they're continuing to recruit people, but it's basically just enough to cover the losses that they're suffering, suffering uh, in ongoing operations. So hypothetically, they could mobilize more if they wanted to, uh, but it's unclear, one, if they want to, uh, it seems not, and two, even if they want to, whether or not they could afford to. Because uh, even with the military expansion that they've experienced over the past two years since the war started, uh, it's not clear if they would be able to generate enough weapons, enough supplies, you know, enough uniforms, uh, radios, etc., in order to actually kit out uh, a massive expansion in personnel. You know, that was a big problem with the first mobilization. Uh, I remember mid 2022, analysts were saying that uh, Russia was delaying mobilization, uh, but that when it did mobilize, it would take the better part of a year in order to actually mobilize a large number of people into the army. And you know there was some controversy over that, but that's basically what ended up happening. It took them like eight to nine months or so uh, to mobilize a couple hundred thousand new troops into the army, and uh, it was difficult. You know, it strained their logistical networks. You know, it's uh, it was hard for the Russian government to find all of the stuff basically that you need to kit out all of those people, and so that would likely be a problem again. It may not be as much of a problem. Uh, given industrial expansion, but it will likely still be challenging. And it may be that it's challenging enough that the Russian government would prefer not to do it and would prefer to just try to continue operations in Ukraine with the troops they already have deployed. Uh, that doesn't even get into the political costs of mobilization. You know, the Russian government allegedly is concerned about uh, public opinion and how much it might decline in the face of an actual full mass mobilization for war in Ukraine. So that's an additional barrier there. Uh, I don't know how much they actually care about public opinion at this point, so I don't know how much uh, weight that reasoning really has, but nominally that is something to consider when looking at the Russian calculus here on mass mobilization. Uh, let's see, we, we never talked about the Black Sea. Have you heard about this at all? What's this? So, you know, at the start of the war, the Russian Navy blockaded the coast of Ukraine and tried to prevent them from uh, engaging in, you know, the normal export of their grain exports, which is their main export item. And then there was the big grain deal where Ukraine negotiated the export of grain 
uh, through a corridor that was negotiated with the Russians uh, so that they could get some out. So the grain deal ended up breaking down in 23, and then it was renegotiated, and then it's kind of been on again, off again since then to varying degrees. It's a little bit unclear. But one of the big developments in 2023 uh, is that Ukrainian operations in the Black Sea significantly picked up. So I think everybody remembers back in 2022 when the Ukrainians successfully sunk uh, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Uh, I think it was called the Moskva. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of similar incidents in the rest of 22, but in 23, they picked up again and they've sunk a number of ships, generally smaller ships, nothing necessarily too big. Uh, but of more concern to the Russians has been fairly consistent raiding of uh, the base at Sevastopol. Uh, as well as as well as the harrying and harassment of Russian ships on patrol in the Black Sea, uh, the Ukrainians have used drones, both uh, airborne drones and actually waterborne drones, in order to, to uh, conduct that con campaign. And uh, the Russian Navy tried to maintain a forward presence uh, west of Crimea, you know, in the area they needed to control in order to prevent, uh, in order to continue to blockade Ukraine. Uh, but they ended up actually withdrawing most of their forces from Sevastopol. That's not to say they're not present west of Crimea. You know, they still have forces there in the Black Sea. But as far as where those forces are based, most of them are no longer based in Sevastopol. Most of them have actually now uh, moved to uh, a naval base in Novocherkask. Is that what it's called? I forget the name. But basically it's in the Kuban, sort of that southern region of Russia. Uh, near the Caucasus. So those forces, the fact that those forces had to redeploy was indicative of the degree of pressure, pressure the Russian Navy was under. And, uh, you know, you can argue that's kind of a mild victory in the grand scheme of things. You know, the Russians do still have the capacity to project force in the Black Sea, but uh, it does suggest that the Ukrainians have been able to continue to contest the Black Sea, even though they themselves effectively have no Navy right now. And uh, this has been a subject of considerable interest even outside Ukraine, uh, because this is an example of a sort of smaller, weaker opponent using modern technology to offset uh, major, you know, offset the advantages of a more technologically uh, advanced and more numerically superior opponent. So, you know, the Russian Navy, obviously much bigger than Ukraine's Navy, much more advanced, but the Ukrainians have been able to contest the seas despite that. So that's of great interest to the U.S. Navy in particular, because uh, the Chinese government has been investing in, uh, uh, what do they call them, asymmetrical abilities, basically. So Ukraine has been using similar such asymmetrical approaches to its conflict with the Russian Navy. And so there's some consternation in Washington correspondingly. Like, obviously, people like the fact that Ukraine is successfully contesting the Black Sea and putting enough pressure on the Russian Navy that they cannot navigate the Black Sea uh, without fear. But at the same time, the fact that Ukraine can do that uh, suggests that opponents of the United States, like, say, China, could do that to the U.S., which is a problem for the U.S. Navy. So that's, that's instigated considerable conversation in the United States government on that count. And there's been a bigger push uh, to invest in things like counter drone technologies of one kind or another in order to ensure that if war breaks out with China or some other kind of competitor, uh, that we do have countermeasures in place that will be able to deal with that threat. Uh, I would point out that uh, it's not all bad news for the United States in that regard. In terms of Taiwan, the fact that a smaller power can use asymmetrical methods like this uh, to contest a more powerful Navy uh, is actually a net positive, because that suggests that the Taiwan would find it easier, not harder, to contest the waters around itself in the event of a Chinese invasion. And that, of course, is by extension a good thing for the United States, which hypothetically uh, would intervene in the case of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So the Chinese could use asymmetrical methods against us when we try to help Taiwan, but in turn, Taiwan will be using those same methods against the Chinese Navy and possibly could uh, negate any significant advantage they gain by denying uh, the space around Taiwan to the United States Navy. So some interesting strategic implications there in terms of naval warfare. Uh, did you follow the Battle of Avdivka at all? I did not. Uh, so the capital of Donetsk province is, well, also Donetsk, it's the same name. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, when the fighting stopped after 2014, uh, the front line was basically like all of maybe 10 miles uh, from the city. And uh, one of the towns on the outskirts of Donetsk that uh, the Ukrainians were able to hold on to was a town called Avdivka. And that was a part of a whole chain of fortified positions that the Ukrainians created along that front line with the various, with the two separatist republics that were set up uh, by the Russian government in 2014. So recently, or, well, I shouldn't say recently, over the past couple months, roughly, uh, the Russian military has been launching an offensive targeting of Divka, uh, trying to surround it, cut it off, and eventually seize it. And uh, during that time period, the Ukrainians mounted a big defense, but ultimately, uh, I think about a month ago, thereabouts, uh, they ended up withdrawing from the city, uh, from the town, what's left of it anyway. Uh, Whenever there's a battle for a town like this, the town is just fucking obliterated. Uh, Because the style of warfare, as we've discussed before, is heavily artillery-centric. And so Mm -hmm. everything gets blown up. So there's not much of a Divka left to fight over at this point. Uh, But the Ukrainians in the the town were surrounded, were almost surrounded, and so uh, retreat was the only viable option. So they did end up losing the battle. Uh, Very costly in terms of manpower for the Russians, you know, not that that's necessarily a problem for them. Uh, and it took a very long time to get it. And the seizure of Div- Divka is more of a symbolic blow than anything. You know, it does represent ground taken for the Russians, but uh, it doesn't really change the overarching strategic calculus in the region. You know, all of these offensives happening uh, in the Donbass have been very small overall in terms of their ambition. And, uh, you know, there's been some considerable investment of resources into them, but the amount that's gained is generally measured in kilometers. Uh, and not double-digit kilometers generally either. So very small amounts of land being exchanged uh, for great expense of human life. Sounds painful. Very world... Huh, sorry? That sounds painful. Yeah, yeah, it's very World War One-esque. Uh, lots of similarities there. <clears throat> now, more recently, I think in the past week, the Russians have started up a new offensive in sort of uh, northern Donbass, sort of eastern Kharkiv, Mm -hmm. and they've been applying pressure there. And for what I was reading, it's a more sophisticated offensive than any of that they've launched before. Uh, They're launching the attack in four different locations uh, rather than just focusing all in on one. When you uh, say sophisticated offensive, do you mean like with monocles and top hats and stuff or? (laughs) I'm afraid not. That would be much more classy. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's more sophisticated in that the planning is more complex than just throw dudes at one thing. Gotcha. You know, they're attacking along four axes of advance, uh, and so they're dividing basically uh, Ukraine's defense. So instead of being able to focus all their surplus defenders, so to speak, in one area, they have to split them among four. Now that may not make much of a difference. You know, Ukraine has been pretty good at fighting these defensive battles thus far. Uh, obviously, the shortage of ammo hurts, and that may mean that the Russians get more gains out of this than they have in previous offensives. Uh, but we'll see. You know, uh, Ukraine has uh, surprised us before, so who's to say? Uh, but for now, they're under pressure, specifically in that one part of the front. So that's likely what people will be talking about when they talk about changes on the front line for the next, let's say, month or two, or however long the battle ends up lasting. And I'm guessing based on how all of this has played out for Russia, you're going to have some people who are pro-war and some people who are against the war, depending on what their industry is and how it was affected by how it's been playing out. Yes, but it's hard to tell because there's no freedom of speech at this point. Like, even if uh, you're losing money because your industry is one of the losers of the conflict, it's not like you can voice that. (laughs) There's not much you can do. Yeah. You know, even if you're an elite or an oligarch, uh, there's only so much scope you have to express resistance. And, uh, you know, you can express resistance within the patronage network of the of Vladimir Putin. You know, within the halls of power, there's probably more room for criticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even there, there, you can only get away with so much. Like, you're not going to change Putin's mind on the war, most likely. Yeah. You know, you can kind of encourage him to find a conclusion you, know, you can try to find ways to try to help your industry or what you know however it is you're making money uh, but overall it seems like this is Putin's pet project it seems like he wants to make this his sort of legacy achievement 
Mm-hmm. And uh, when you're dealing with a ruler who thinks in those terms, cost-benefit analysis isn't going to get you very far. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there are probably poles of resistance within the government, uh, certainly within broader society, but they just they have no room to maneuver. They have just nothing to work with right now. Mm-hmm. So it's very difficult for them to leverage discontent into any kind of broader substantive opposition that might actually change the government's policy on this. Gotcha. <clears throat> well, let's see. Um, defense industrial base. So obviously aid is a problem for Ukraine. They need it. They're not getting enough, especially from the United States at this point. Uh, one of the ways that both the Ukrainian government and Western partners are uh, trying to exploit to get around this problem is to try to encourage Western defense manufacturers to invest in production in Ukraine, which might surprise people because obviously that's a risky investment. You know, you don't want to dump uh, billions of dollars into a factory in Ukraine that can just be blown up by the Russians because mm-hmm. obviously that would be a legitimate target for them. So they're trying to find ways to get around uh, reluctance on the part of defense partners to do that. Um, they've actually met with some success in this regard. One of the things that they're doing is trying to distribute manufacturing in multiple locations rather than just having it be in one big site. Obviously, that's going to be a little less efficient since you're not going to have the same economies of scale. Uh, but you know, if giving up some economies of scale is the price you pay to get the investment in the first place, needed to build the factory, then that's obviously a trade-off that's worth making. So that's uh, sparked some more interest on the part of foreign investors to try to do this. Uh, Also, also foreign governments like the United States and European governments are encouraging their defense manufacturers to do this, and they're most likely offering various incentives of one kind or another to try to offset the risk. Um, There are certain countries in Eastern Europe in particular that have been very eager to do this, and so they've they've been going out of their way especially to try to incentivize their defense base to uh, participate in these sort of partnership schemes. I think uh, the Baltic states in particular, as well as Poland, are good examples of that. So one of the ways that uh, Ukraine will address its ammunition shortage, as well as just defense needs in general, beyond just continuing to hope and pray that, you know, Washington and Brussels uh, continue to provide support, is to try to build up their own manufacturing capacity. And while that may sound counterintuitive, given the conditions that they're working under, uh, it is working to a degree. You know, they are they have been able to improve production over time. Uh, thus far, it's mostly been in lighter manufacturing, stuff like drones, for example. Uh, they're increasingly self-sufficient on those. Before, somewhat ironically, uh, they'd actually been mostly dependent on imports of Chinese drones, who are, of course, the market leaders in much of the drone market. And while they still do import a lot of Chinese drones, they're increasingly dependent uh, on their own, which are custom designed uh, to the defense needs uh, as defined by people on the front line. Hmm. So this is viable. This is possible. It'll be more difficult with things like tanks and planes, obviously. Uh, But for things like ammunition, for example, it's much more feasible. Uh, And so that's what they're looking at. So in addition to assuming the United States resumes aid at some point, in in addition to significant scaling up of shipments of a uh, of 155 millimeter ammo uh, from western partners uh, ukraine will also be looking forward to significant increases of its own domestic production of ammo like that and that could be signif- that could be of significant use assuming they're able to avoid uh, bombardment from the russians oh there was also some weird shit that i read about So apparently there are some Chechen POWs that Ukraine is holding that the Russian government doesn't really care about, or at least the Chechens fighting in Ukraine don't think Moscow cares about them. So what they've been doing is that they've actually been going to POW camps holding Ukrainian soldiers, and they've been buying Ukrainian POWs from these camps, and then they take them to the Ukrainian, well, basically negotiators for the Ukrainian government, and they offer to swap them uh, for Chechen POWs huh. uh, that the Ukrainians are holding. 
So apparently there is actually a kind of market for Ukrainian POWs uh, behind Russia's lines. Very weird. <laughs> you give us one POW, we give you one POW. Hey, prisoner exchange, that's what we're talking about. That's what we need. Stop fighting. Yeah, I mean, it's a positive step. It's just a very bizarre way, a bizarre manifestation of POW exchange. And I'm guessing they're not supposed to be doing this. I Probably not. <laughs> I mean, really, really, you could say that about just about anything that goes on within the Russian military. <laughs> okay. But especially this. This is especially unusual. So let's see. The other item I had here in the miscellaneous section had to do with occupation. So Russia had its election, obviously. Oh, hang on. So Russia had its election. The thing is that Russia technically annexed a couple provinces of Ukraine. So when Russia had the election, people in the occupied territories also had the election, right? Now, obviously, if you're living in occupied territory, you're not necessarily the most gung-ho to vote uh, in an election, especially one that Vladimir Putin is pretty much guaranteed to win. Mm -hmm. And uh, the occupation authorities kind of assumed that there would be relatively low voter turnout correspondingly. So they had a solution. What they did is that they hired poll workers, quote unquote, to actually go house to house and try to have people fill out ballots in front of them. I would point out that these poll workers had armed guards accompany them. So these people will knock on your door and if you answer, then they'll tell you, hey, fill out this ballot. <laughs> and oh, by the way, these are my armed guards. <laughs> <laughs> Do they tell you who to fill the, out the ballot for? They did not, but you know, it takes some balls to fill out a ballot in front of uh, armed Russian government soldiers uh, and vote for somebody other than Putin. You know, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Now in the article I read about it, they did say that if you don't answer the door, then they kind of leave you alone. So you do have some flexibility there. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people found it just hilarious that, you know, this is how the Russian government was approaching the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, just send armed soldiers around to make people vote and fill out the ballot. There you go. It's a wonder they bothered at all. Chad's saying it's pre-filled for the whole process to be quicker. Oh, that's such a great convenience. <laughs> <laughs> Saves so me a faster. step. Yeah. Well, let's see here. So we did have some diplomatic shenanigans here. This is stuff that's been in the news. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. Um, so there's been tensions between Ukraine and Poland over grain. Have you heard about this? No. Oh, wait. Yes, someone in my chat said Polish farmers were mad at Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. That's they didn't what say this why. Is. So Ukraine is one of the largest grain producers in the world. Uh, because of the Russian blockade, there's been a significant there's been a significant curtailment of Ukrainian grain exports, and so correspondingly, uh, Ukraine has been leaning on its Western partners to help it find ways around the blockade. So one of the ways was to try to get Ukrainian grain into places like Romania and Bulgaria uh, that have ports on the Black Sea through which Ukrainian grain could be exported uh, while circumventing the Russian blockade. You know, that worked, but the trouble was uh, that ports in Bulgaria and Romania were not really large enough to handle the sheer scale of Ukrainian grain exports. So they needed further alternatives. So one of them was to ship grain by rail uh, through Poland into either European markets or to European ports where they could be exported onward to final markets. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble there is that there is some suspicion uh, that Ukrainian grain is ending up in Poland, which is not supposed to happen. The, Poland, the Polish government agreed to allow shipments of Ukrainian grain through Poland, but it's not supposed to be unloaded and sold there. Mm -hmm. And the reason the Polish government doesn't want that is because uh, Polish farmers have to compete with that grain. You know, it lowers gra grain prices to have all of this Ukrainian grain dumped on the Polish market. So Polish farmers are upset about that. Uh, it's unclear how much Ukrainian grain is actually ending up on the market, but prices have fallen. So there's a lot of suspicions that some of it anyway is being smuggled into the country. 
So Polish farmers have responded to that by protesting, blocking roads, and otherwise trying to disrupt the shipment of this grain out of Ukraine. And it's turned into kind of a sore point in relations uh, because the Polish government has felt obligated to try to address this problem uh, by limiting some shipments of Ukrainian grain. I think it was suspended for a while, a couple months ago even. Yeah, there's a similar issue in Poland regarding trucks. Uh, Poland had not historically allowed Ukrainian trucks to operate in its territory. Uh, so if you wanted to ship something in Poland, you either had to use Polish trucks or trucks from some other member of the European Union. Uh, but on account of the war in Ukraine, uh, the, the block to Ukrainian trucks entering Poland and the U European market uh, were lifted. You know, the European Union decided to allow that in order to not only help you know, Ukrainian truckers, but also to make it easier uh, for Ukrainian goods, especially grain, to be shipped out of the country. And so the trouble there is that by allowing all of this additional capacity into the country, uh, the wages of Polish truck drivers fell. And that, of course, was very upsetting to them. And so they started protesting themselves, uh, up to and including completely blocking the road, or at least one of the main roads, uh, through which Ukraine was sending and receiving goods and services, uh, which, of course, was a big problem for Ukraine's economy. So the truckers needed to be appeased. The Polish government ended up promising them uh, that they would extend further support to them in order to offset the decline in wages. Uh, I don't know if they've actually done that yet, so the truckers are still pretty pissed off about it and they still protest occasionally. Uh, but this is another sore point here in relations, uh, because obviously the Ukrainian government would like to see more solidarity from the Polish government on this count. Uh, the Polish government counters by noting that they've already sent a lot of military aid and they've accepted a huge number of Ukrainian refugees. So it's not as though they're not helping. Uh, but in terms of this kind of economic assistance, there's more friction. And so the Polish government has not felt as free to act uh, in this area. And the Ukrainian government has kind of felt that and complained about it correspondingly. So there's some political tension that has resulted from this. And it has yet to be resolved fully. Hmm. Just imagining that Ukrainian grain is like a scheduled drug like weed. And you have smugglers who are like, hey, man, you want some of the good stuff? And you're like, what is that weed in that bag? He's like, no, way stronger. It's Ukrainian grain. <laughs> like, what? You can't have that here. That's illegal. He's like, shh, keep your voice down. And on trade is a very contentious issue. Mm -hmm. I refer you to Brexit for such an example. <laughs> Oh, I need to do a podcast on Brexit sometime. I've got notes for it. I just need to put them all together. We have a Ukrainian viewer in the chat. Hello, welcome. They said there are farmers protests in other countries as well, in Slovakia and Hungary, but not on the same scale of the Polish. Gotcha. Yeah, Poland is bigger, and also it shares a border with Ukraine. So there's a lot more scope for disruption as far as protesters go. Mm-hmm. So it's been much more visible, noticeable. I think I even read that there's video of uh, protesters attacking a train carrying Ukrainian grain and then just emptying it. They just opened it up and dumped all the grain on the ground. Hmm. So they're, they're quite aggravated over this. Are these the bread wars? <laughs> Not yet. Not that bad yet. But people don't like it when they uh, lose income. Yeah. Whatever the cause of that may be, you can be sure it's going to become a political issue in short order. That's fair. Chat saying the French farmers are also mad that Ukrainian chickens are being imported. Oh, I had not heard about that. Hmm. Makes sense. I just hadn't heard about it. Yeah, in general, farmers in Europe are kind of pissy right now, not just because of Ukraine, but also because of uh, environmental regulations that have been uh, increasing a number of restrictions on them and their operations, generally related to the green transition. So they've been coming out and protesting in force correspondingly. What kind of things would affect a, a farmer? Are you talking like industrial farms or like local farmers? Uh, both, I guess. You know, pretty much uh, food processing has come under scrutiny and there's been more regulations there.
Uh, energy costs have been higher on account of the green transition generally. Uh, so that, of course, is a problem because uh, things like animal feed, uh, the price of animal feed, I should say, is heavily correlated with things like uh, oil prices and uh, other energy prices. Mm. Because that's a key input in the production of animal feed. And so uh, also food prices in general correlate with those, although that's obviously not a problem if you're a farmer. Uh, but your inputs have been significantly increasing in cost if mm -hmm. you're a farmer in Europe uh, over the past couple of years. And uh, some of that has been uh, some of that has been ascribed, uh, attributed, let's say, to the green transition and policies uh, that are being implemented in the European Union that are meant to push the green transition. And there's also things like uh, increasing transportation costs. Uh, owing to governments trying to push uh, transportation companies to use more uh, renewable energy type stuff, you know, electric vehicles, trucks, you know, all that cost money. Um, yeah, it, it's a lot of little things. It's not like any one thing you can point to and say that's what's pissing them off. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want an example, you can look at the Yellow Vest protests in France a couple of years ago. Uh, those protests started because of a proposed tax on cars, I think it was, or was it a road tax? It was some kind of tax on vehicle travel. I don't remember exactly, but it disproportionately impacted people outside of the major cities. Because of course, if you live in a major European city, you probably got pretty decent public transportation and don't have to drive too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you live outside of one of those urban centers, cars are much more important. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people living in rural areas felt that the tax, even if it was well intended uh, as a part of the green transition, uh, disproportionately impacted some of the poorest people in the country. Because obviously rural folks are generally not that much, are not wealthy relative to urbanites. So it's things like that that have been aggravating, you know, rural folks in Europe over the past couple of years. And it's kind of come to a head over the past six months or so, especially in Germany. I think we talked about that before. I think it's a pretty manageable problem. You know, it's not as though Europe doesn't have money, so they can probably increase transfers. Germany in particular has financial scope to do that. You know, the whole reason they're having problems right now is because their Supreme Court told the government that it couldn't use uh, money in its budget that had been a, that had been allocated to deal with COVID for uh, agricultural subsidies. So hypothetically, you know, they could get that money if they really needed to and use it for agricultural subsidies and try to tamper down some of this unrest. You know, the money is there. The Supreme Court has just said you can't use that specific money for this specific thing. So this is kind of a technical problem that probably could be solved pretty easily if German politics were a little more flexible. Well, let's see, let's get to the fun one here. Uh, I guess this, uh, it's not fun at first. I mean, there's a security conference called the Munich Security Conference. And so uh, they, they have that, I think, annually. And it was kind of a downer this year because you know things aren't going great in Ukraine. And uh, there's a sense that Europe uh, is not really capable, you know, fully of supporting Ukraine on its own, which is increasingly possible given that Trump could win re-election and hypothetically, possibly, uh, could abandon Ukraine entirely. And so, you know, the broader implications of a Trump re-election also themselves were kind of a downer for Europe. Does the so executive not... have that much power to just be like, okay, we're not giving aid anymore? Yes, but hypothetically, Congress could force his hand if it wanted to. Congress is the most powerful branch. Mm. Uh, that is to say, the legislature in the United States is the most powerful branch. But here's the problem. You know, the Republican Party is increasingly just the Trump party, and mm. they just kind of do what he wants. So, you know, you saw a lot of opposition to uh, some of the isolationist tendencies of Trump in his first term. But more and more of the party is increasingly loyal specifically to him and not to, ser and not to these sort of uh, traditional Republican ideals, especially in terms of national security. Uh, that led many Republicans to oppose Trump on some of these things in his first term. And that being the case, it seems less likely uh, 
that the Republican Party would put up nearly as much of a fight in a second Trump term uh, as they did in the first when they were trying to stop him from, you know, pulling out of Syria or uh, cutting off ties to Europe, you know, things like that. So it seems like he would have much more free reign in a potential second term. Hence the concern by Europe. Mm -hmm. So the Munich Security Conference was not fun. You know, it was a lot of complaining and hand wringing and uh, whinging for the most part. So then, uh, what, a week or two after that, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, came out and gave an interview, uh, which was very controversial. And this is the fun one. Because <laughs> what he did is during this interview, he said that the West should not rule out sending troops to Ukraine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was quite the incendiary statement, given how uh, cautious the West has been about its involvement in Ukraine. You know, clearly the West is involved, but uh, there's been a lot of reluctance to significantly escalate involvement, uh, certainly over a very short time span. You know, everything that the West has done has been done very slowly and deliberately. So the idea that a major Western leader like Macron would come out and says, you know, maybe we should deploy some guys there. We should rule it out. Uh, that was a big deal. And that had a lot of uh, people arguing and talking within Europe. Um, the immediate reaction on the part of uh, other European leaders was, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> that was seen as, that's broadly still seen as too much of an escalation uh, with the potential for a direct conflict with the, Russia, which of course a lot of, which of course most people really don't want, even if they support Ukraine. There were some leaders who were more open to it, uh, not necessarily to just openly deploying troops, but the idea that the West should not take it off the table, that specifically had some leaders agreeing with Macron. Uh, I think specifically Baltic state leaders. Uh, unsurprisingly, the Baltics are pretty hawkish as far as Russia goes, for obvious reasons. You know, so they tend to be the most uh, hawkish in terms of issues like this. Uh, so a few voices of agreement, but for the most part, everybody says, we're, we're not doing that. That's not an actual thing we're considering. Uh, so after that, though, one of the things that happened is that the Prime Minister of Germany, Schultz, uh, gave a speech in which he said, you know, categorically, we are not going to do this. We are not deploying troops to, U to Ukraine. We are not going to fight Russia. However, the problem was that during this speech, he accidentally revealed the fact that there actually were Western personnel already in Ukraine. Uh, largely in a technical role. Basically, uh, a couple, what, last year, I don't remember when, the British government agreed to supply Ukraine with Storm Shadow missiles, which are cruise missiles. Storm Shadow. Yeah, cool name. Uh, so in addition to sending the missiles, however, they also kind of on the down low sent technical personnel to help the Ukrainians use the missiles. Now that had been more or less a secret like it, it's not necessarily surprising, you know, it, there probably are other Western personnel in sort of advise and assist roles in Ukraine. Uh, not that many, but some. But in general, Western governments prefer not to talk about that too much uh, for fear of escalation. So the fact that Schultz just came out and blurted out the fact that they were there was actually a breach of the line, so to speak, on this issue. And, uh, you know, as much backlash as Macron got, for saying that uh, the West should not rule out sending troops, Schultz actually got a lot more pushback, uh, especially diplomatically after he did this. You know, I mean, the French government, the British government specifically, all but came out and asked him what the fuck he was doing. <laughs> so everybody was mad at Schultz for a while after that. And then as a result of that gaffe, uh, there immediately came into being this dispute, this uh, debate about Taurus missiles. So Taurus is a German cruise missile. And there's been some pressure on Germany to provide Taurus missiles to Ukraine. Now, obviously, the German government doesn't want to do that. They've ruled it out. They've categorically said, no, there's no way we would do that. Uh, but in the wake of this you know, scandal, this issue uh, over his speech, that pressure got ramped up. And so now Prime Minister Schultz is saying, well, we won't give them to Ukraine. But we might be opening, we might be open to giving them to the British, 
And then if the British want, maybe they can give them to Ukraine. And oh, by the way, if the British want to send technical personnel to Ukraine uh, to help them with the Taurus missiles, well, we would not be opposed to that. Hmm. So a lot of people were very critical of that, even people that supported it, even people that want Germany to send missiles and that approve of this idea were very critical of the logic uh, of it and with the way it unfolded. Because in general, Germany has been very, very reluctant uh, to part with items like this. You know, aid, They have sent significant amounts of aid to Ukraine, uh, but it hasn't been nearly as much as people would like. And the bigger criticism is that the German government tends to shoot itself in its own foot uh, by continually setting these sort of lines in the sand that it says it will not cross. You know, it's one thing if Russia sets red lines and says, you can't do this. Uh, but the criticism of Germany is that they set their own red lines and say, well, we won't we won't cross these red lines, right? The red lines for Germany, not for Russia. And uh, a lot of people criticize that because they say that it's just self-defeating. It's it's basically just conceding things to Russia and uh, dispelling with what might otherwise be useful strategic ambiguity, right? Rather than telling Russia what you're not going to do, tell them what you will do. You know, have your own red lines for them. But that's not what the German government has been doing. Uh, they prefer to sit back and try to take steps that are more designed to reassure Russia than challenge it. And, uh, you know, the, the stupid thing here, especially, and this is another element of the criticism uh, of Germany's foreign policy here, is that they actually do end up sending more stuff anyway. Like, they'll set a red line for themselves that they're not going to do X, Y, Z, and then they'll end up doing it anyway, like a couple months later, generally under pressure from allies. You know, there was the Abrams debate, for example, you know, should we be sending tanks? Like, this was in 2022. And the Germans said, well, no, we don't want to, the German government, I should say, said, no, we don't want to send Leopard 2 tanks. It's too much of an escalation. But then there was more and more pressure. And finally, the United States basically made a deal with the German government and said, okay, we're going to announce that we will release some older models of M1 Abrams to Ukraine. And so then that was enough to get the German government to agree to allow some transfers of Leopard tanks to Ukraine. And it was mostly symbolic, like the M1 is not is not really a great tank to be sending to allies. You know, it's complicated. It's very fuel inefficient. There are better options. And ultimately, we didn't even agree to send very many of them. Like, it was pretty obvious uh, Washington was just doing that as a symbolic gesture to appease the German government because they were afraid of being seen as doing this unilaterally. You know, they wanted it to seem like a multilateral thing in order to reduce the risk of backlash. From Moscow, as though Moscow was going to care, right? You know, the fact that you're sending them at all is what they're going to care about. So you've already pissed them off from the start. So, you know, this sort of um, confused messaging, you know, this sort of Germany's policy is at cross purposes with itself. And uh, the German government can't really seem to decide how to set an objective and just pursue it. Like they're just always second guessing themselves. And it's creating these weird signals in their foreign policy that don't really need to be there. So, you know, the Taurus missile imbroglio is a perfect example of that. Like they said, we won't send them. And then they, and then they said, well, actually, we will kind of send them, but just through a circuitous route so that the Russians don't blame us. Well, spoiler alert, they're going to blame you anyway. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not mitigating the damage here. You're not fooling anybody with this bullshit. Like everybody knows what you're doing. So, you know, it would, if you're going to do it, it would be better just to commit to it and own it. You know, as is, they keep trying to find these little ways around it. Uh, you know, the best argument in favor of doing things like that that I read is German domestic politics, uh, where a lot of people actually support that and prefer a milder approach to support for Ukraine, uh, specifically out of concern for Russia, if not suspicion of Ukraine anyway. Uh, but even so, like the German government, while it does want to recognize and should recognize that sentiment, um, ultimately is running against that sentiment anyway by doing stuff like this. Again, they're not fooling anybody. Like Stuff like this, gimmicks like this are not fooling anybody. You're going to get the blame for it anyway. So if you're going to do it at all, do it in a smart way that at least preserves strategic ambiguity in a way that challenges Russia and the war in Ukraine and not in a way where you're just needlessly creating difficulties for everybody involved. You know, that's the criticism here of German foreign policy. And so that's what people have been discussing uh, since Macron's speech. Someone was saying that the <clears throat> the Finns were also posturing a similar way of uh, teasing the idea of sending troops. 
Yeah, I think Finland's government was one of the ones that tacitly agreed with Macron that it should not <clears throat> it should not be ruled out. Gotcha. But I haven't read anything yet that Finland is actually teasing it. It actually kind of wants to send troops. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have a source on it, I would love to see it because you know I. I should, I, just, I should do the usual disclaimer. I'm not an expert on everything I talk about on here. You know, more painfully obvious at some times than others. So if I ever say anything wrong, stupid, or biased, please do correct me. If I'm wrong, I want to know more than anybody. Uh, so participation by chat is uh, encouraged in that regard. I don't read chat while we do this, but uh, I will read it later. So, you know, if there is information out there to the effect that Finland actually does uh, want to jump into the conflict, by all means, let me know. I, I would certainly be very interested uh, to read about that but my impression as of now is not that is is that they don't want to do that i, I have not heard any evidence to that effect <laughs> we have a first-hand account each of the three fins i know loathes russia <laughs> they have a history yeah a little bit they've got some history there you want some trivia on that? Sure. Did you know, Nero, that Finland used to be a part of Russia? <gasps> really? Yeah. Back when it was the Russian Empire under the Tsars, mm. uh, Finland had been a part of Russia from, I think, like the mid-late 1700s, if I'm not mistaken. I trust that the guys in chat will know better than I, but I think it was like late 1700s when Russia annexed Finland. And then it was a part of Russia for a hundred plus years or so until the uh, October Revolution hmm. uh, in 1917. And so as part of uh, the Russian Civil War, a number of uh, the more westerly parts of Russia broke off and became independent countries. Uh, some of that was the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which was signed with the Germans in order to uh, end the war and uh, get Russia out of it. Part of the uh, concessions among the concessions that the Bolsheviks had to make to sign that peace treaty was basically giving up all of the land uh, that the Germans had occupied uh, as of the treaty signing, which was actually a huge chunk. Uh, the Russian army basically collapsed uh, during the revolution. And the result is that the German troops were pushing against an open door. Like nobody, there was virtually no organized resistance. And so they made huge territorial gains until the Bolsheviks finally came to the table and agreed to a peace treaty. Uh, the Bolsheviks, somewhat stupidly, had believed that they didn't need to negotiate a peace treaty uh, because they assumed that all of the soldiers in the German army would surely mutiny and revolt against their generals once they saw that communists had actually managed to successfully overthrow a government. They assumed that the revolution started in Russia would expand to the rest of Europe. Uh, mm. Didn't happen. <laughs> Instead, uh, like many ideologues throughout history, they ended up colliding with reality and being severely disappointed. So after realizing that the German army was not in fact going to mutiny and was going to just march through in the entirety of Russia, they finally agreed to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And so the result is that Ukraine, uh, and actually some of Belarus, certainly all of Russian Poland and the Baltic states, all became independent countries. Uh, not always for very long, in the case of Ukraine, for example, but uh, that was the immediate cost of peace. Now, over the course of the Civil War, Finland managed to break away and also declare its independence. And if you know anything about the 1920s and 30s, you know that a lot of Russian foreign policy in the early Soviet Union, especially in the 1930s and 40s, was geared towards reconquering these lost territories. So, you know, a big chunk of what had been Russian Poland actually was reconquered and incorporated into Belarus, uh, where it's actually, uh, which is, still retains that territory to today. Uh, the Baltic states also conquered. Uh, they even, you know, obviously Ukraine was reconquered, but they even reconquered Moldova, which you would not think would be a big priority. Uh, but they went out of their way to get it anyway. You know, they pulled it away from Romania, uh, kicking and screaming. So Finland was on the list. They were one of the ones that got away, and so they were set also uh, to be reconquered. You know, they they framed the war as being about territory. They said they wanted a buffer zone for St. Petersburg or whatever. Uh, but you know the general pattern was not one of buffer zones like it was pretty clear uh by that point that the soviet union was angling for recovery of what had been previously russian territory so they made their move and it went really poorly i think every i think everybody listening to this channel right now is is familiar with the winter war you know i think most of you are uh 
war nerds to various degrees. So you know it didn't go great for the Russians. They did eventually win, but between the pressure from the West and the continuing cost of the war, the Russians ultimately found it preferable to sign a peace treaty. You know, so Finland lost territory, but more importantly, they preserved their independence. And they were able to keep it even all even through World War II uh, and after into the Cold War. Uh, it's all the more impressive because Finland actually was a Nazi German ally during World War II. You know, after the Winter War ended, Finland uh, did not feel particularly safe around the Soviet Union. And so they actually allied with Nazi Germany. And they actually participated in Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. Uh, their role was somewhat limited. They preferred just to reconquer the territories they had lost to the Soviet Union in the Winter War. Uh, but beyond that, they didn't actually continue further offensive operations, much to the chagrin of the Germans. Uh, but, you know, if you know what happened in World War II, you know that things did not go well for Germany. And so that put Finland in an exceedingly awkward spot, because mm -hmm. uh, now they're at war with the Soviet Union and again, and they're on the march. So what do you do? Well, luckily for Finland, the Soviets decided it was better just to sign a peace treaty with them and get them out of the war, uh, rather than just outright invade all of Finland. You know, Finland was not a high enough priority in that regard. So they stayed focused on the Nazis, and Finland was able, luckily, to continue to retain its independence. So kind of dodged a bullet there. Very risky move to join a war against the Soviet Union, and it very nearly went very badly for them, but they made it. And as a result, they continue to exist today. But yeah, the uh, sort of rivalry, you might say, between Finland and Russia goes back well before uh, the Winter War. You know, back when they were still a part of uh, the Russian Empire, uh, there was uh, an effort by the Russian government to Russify the population. You know, Russification was like the official policy over the long term. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of Finns resented that. Yeah, there were more than a few ethnic Russians that uh, continued to live in Finland even after Finland became independent and ended up fighting in their army uh, in the Winter War against Russian soldiers. Hmm. And uh, yeah, it's one of one of the some weird one of the weird oddities of military history. You know, World War II was chock full of those. But yeah, in Finland, it manifested as uh, Russo Finnish soldiers fighting against Soviet Russian soldiers in the Winter War. I would point out too that Finland was not a fascist country, right? They didn't have a fascist government. They actually did have a authoritarian government as led by General Mannerheim, uh, but. They were not fascist, and so they did not go after their Jews. You know, they were allowed to, you know, just live peacefully, basically. So the result is that there were actually Jewish Finnish soldiers technically fighting on the same side of World War II as Nazi Germany. Huh. Because Definitely Finland was the, fine with the Jews, yeah. so they're like, okay, this country is fine to fight for. <laughs> yeah, but they were allied with Germany. Interesting. Yeah, so one of, one of the wilder... <laughs> oddities of the war you might say I pulled up the map of the Russian Empire before the October Revolution and I can see Finland, Estonia, Latvia Poland all within that uh, realm and those territories were all lost yeah interesting so the so Russia basically contracted whenever the revolution occurred but then <clears throat> did some of these countries get uh, brought back into the Soviet Union, so they effectively retook them just under a different administration? Uh, yeah, they reconquered them outright. The Baltics were invaded uh, basically as part of an agreement, a secret agreement with the Nazis uh, that allowed the Soviets to reconquer them. Uh, there was no real resistance. You know, the Baltic states were too weak to resist the Russian army. So they basically just rolled in and said, hey, you're Russian now. Mm. Do not resist. Uh, Moldova, you can see down there at the bottom, that's the one southwest of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see the dot that says Brest-Litovsk? It's in the west. It's in, like, Poland. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. Yes. So roughly everything east of that was re-annexed as well. And to this day remains a part of uh, Belarus, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. All right, yeah, because Belarus is north of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. So when the Germans invaded Poland, the Soviets also invaded in 1939, like a, a couple weeks later. Mm -hmm. And so they roughly divided Poland in half. And so uh, the Germans had to give up the western half that they took at the end of World War II, because obviously they lost. But uh, more fun trivia for you, the Soviets actually never gave up 
the eastern part of Poland that they conquered at that time. Hmm. And again, they incorporated that into Belarus, where it remains to this day. So Belarus was part of the Soviet Union, and then it became its own country? Uh, no, it was always part of the Russian Empire. I don't think it ended up getting separated, but a lot of territory that is now Belarus was separated as a result of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Mm -hmm. yeah, keep in mind that a good chunk of Belarus was historically Polish territory. So even if, you know, if there were not ethnic Poles actually living there, then the uh, Belarusian population was heavily influenced by Polish culture. Mm -hmm. you know, so the Poles, the po Poland has historically been way bigger than it is now. They had a lot of Pole. So uh, yes, uh, well, no, at the time, Belarus was much smaller. It was probably like half the size it is now. Uh, but again, the eastern part of Poland was annexed into Belarus and it became larger. So it's a, it's a little hard to answer your question, just given how many times the territory in question flipped uh, from one country yeah, to the yeah. other. Yeah, the, yeah, the borders of the territories have been decided for the people there multiple times. Yeah, and yeah. It's changed hands, but yeah. Interesting. So Romania was never a Soviet state. No, no. But uh, Moldova was, mm -hmm. which historically had been a part of Romania. Gotcha. It used to be called Bessarabia. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you brought up the map. I thought the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk ceded more territory than that, but I guess I was wrong. And I thought it extended into Ukraine, but doesn't look to be the case. But yeah, Romania was not part of Russia. It historically was kind of part of the Russian sphere of influence. That kind of dates back to the Russian Empire in the 19th century when there was a lot of rivalry with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they'd been rivals with the Ottomans for a long time. That was, that was not new for the 19th century. Uh, but the Ottomans had a pretty strong hold on the Balkans uh, up until the 19th century or so. And uh, during that time in particular, the Russians really started supporting countries like uh, Romania and Bulgaria and uh, other states that had been under the Ottoman thumb. And so a lot of them, at least in part, owe their independence to support from Russia, which is partly why a lot of people in those countries still have relatively favorable impressions of Russia, even to, this, even to this day. That makes sense, though. Like you were the liberator at some point in time. So some people still kind of see you as that hero. Yeah. Yeah, I remember we had a guy kind of uh, critiquing that, because I think I said in an earlier episode that there was a lot of support for Russia in those places, and he corrected me. And he pointed out that actually there's not a lot of support for Russia, but there are some people that have an affinity for Russia, mm -hmm. just not a majority. That makes sense. Oh, I actually, sorry, complete change of topic. Uh, I've read more of the book since we last talked. Oh, cool. And was reading about the workings of the American Revolution and the different regions are responding to the British sending troops over in dramatically different ways. So the Yankees are basically the most die-hard patriot fuck the crown, like we're going at them. <laughs> if you're not with us, you're against us. Like they were hostile in the sense of if you weren't joining the cause, you would be having trouble with your business and so on and people would be skeptical of you. It wasn't really like a perfectly idealistic revolution because no revolution is right if you really want to yeah. get people to go for a cause you do have to be aware of spies in your midst and that kind of thing so it ends up being very paranoid and uh, aggressive with how the revolution is done but there were entire regions where they just let the british troops come in and they were actually seen as like liberators so, oh my gosh you're saving us from the crazy yankees thank you so much <laughs> for being here we're really happy that you're here so like New York and uh, some places, I think in Georgia as well, was a place where like they were like, we don't want any part of this. We're fine with where we are and what we're doing, so we don't really need to uh, commit ourselves to a battle. So I think that aspect isn't really taught in school of like the American Revolution wasn't really a unanimous revolution of all the groups really wanting equally badly to be free. It was like once people realized the momentum was in favor of the colonies making the United States, they're like, okay, well, I guess this is how we're doing it now. But they weren't really spearheading it the same way that the Yankees were, who were a lot more of the 
idealistic ones, also more educated, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would find just the concept of monarchy to be more uh, offensive. And then the notion of uh, taxation increasing and then also being uh, forced uh, administrators who are sent over to kind of govern your area. That's going to be really offensive to their initial purpose of basically going across an ocean and being left alone. Because that's how it started, right? You go across an ocean and it's very, very hard to administrate across the ocean. So you get to pretty much do whatever you want. And tacitly, you should follow the rules of your respective nation, but the enforcement mechanisms just weren't there, which is how all these different regions kind of blossom their own economy based on whatever's available there and whatever structure they decide for themselves. But because they had very different economies in these regions of the like pre-United States, there wasn't really equal reason for them to resist the crown all at the same time. But they're kind of seeing, okay, how is George Washington doing as he's going to bat with actual troops uh, versus do we want to join his side or do we want to support the crown who's going to win because i think a lot of the fence sitters for any conflict like this they're just kind of waiting for one side to emerge as the more powerful and just make sure that they don't get devastated by the exchange of power because you really just want to do your business and live your life for a lot of people who aren't uh, joining the cause so to speak yeah it just made me think of it when we're talking about the October Revolution, and I just Googled some images of the map, and it was one of the images was talking about the transition from idealism to terror with uh, the Soviet Union. Of yeah, they start with some legit good principles of you've had czars over you for a long time that have a stranglehold on power, and it's not very evenly shared power, and the poor might not be well off. So it makes sense that you might want to try a new model, and communism does promise a more equal share between people. So on paper, it seemed like a really cool idea. So you can really fire people up with that idealism. But even in the most idealistic and good revolution, there is a lot of aggressive enforcement of the ideals. And then the ideals are things that you can never really live up to either. And people also fall back into those uh, human pitfalls of people who are power hungry tend to end up in powerful positions in that government even though that's a communist government, doesn't mean that everyone has equal share of the country. There are some people who will filter to the top who do administrative stuff, who can be corrupt and will be corrupt and abuse the system in what's effectively a very similar setup to having a czar. Like, I guess it kind of points to a question of what's the difference between the czar's power and Putin's power? Because they seem kind of similar. Putin does partly model his legitimacy and governance on the Russian Empire. Uh, but it's different in the sense that the Tsar's power was absolute and predicated on divine provenance. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, uh, what do they call it? Uh, divine right of kings, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Putin, on the other hand, is basically just uh, basically the boss of a political machine that has managed to get a monopoly on political power in Russia. But he didn't so make it, that machine. Mm, depends on how you want to define it. Because he's definitely refined it over time. Mm -hmm. you know, he's built his own patronage network for sure. Those are his people in there. Mm -hmm. So he has built that. But you could argue that uh, the model that he's using was actually pioneered either by Boris Yeltsin specifically or is just modeled on prototypical Russian political behavior. Because mm -hmm. the idea of building out a patronage network is actually a running theme through Russian politics for the past hundred years or so. Because he's not really doing anything that you would not have seen in the Soviet Union. The only difference is that uh, there's less organization, less professionalism, and less, well, I should say fewer breaks on the exercise of his power. Because even in the Soviet period, you have different factions and poles of power within the Communist Party, right? It was relatively difficult for one guy to just take over and be the authoritarian leader uh, of the whole party and the whole country. Stalin did that, obviously. But then one of the lessons learned from Stalin and his time in power was that they really needed to prevent that from happening again, because obviously it had dire side effects. Mm 
So one of the norms that the Communist Party implemented in the wake of Stalin's death was, uh, of a, well, several norms actually were implemented in order to try to pre prevent another Stalin-like figure from ever coming to power again. And uh, incidentally, one of the reasons Gorbachev was so controversial within the party is he actually started breaching those norms. You know, it wasn't just that he was a reformer and wanted to open up the politics, open up the economy. Uh, perhaps more egregious than either of these was the fact that he was taking steps to implement his policies uh, that involved breaching these norms. And there was a sense within the party that he might actually be another strongman leader in the Stalin vein, trying to take control of the entire party and sublimate it to his own will. Mm -hmm. So the party, despite its authoritarianism, actually offered relatively more restrictions on the exercise of power and more political competition uh, than the current Putin regime does, ironically. So there's a big difference then between the Putin government, which again is like a straight political monopoly predicated on, uh, well, built out of a political machine, an extended patronage network, that on one hand, and then divine right of kings on the other. It's so radically different in that sense. Gotcha. So the source of where the power is coming from is different. I guess, yeah, as people gradually have less respect for the divine right of kings, then they're going to question the monarchs more. So whenever you're in a post-monarch world, you do have to have a different reason for why you have power. Yeah. I think North Korea's uh, leadership is probably the closest to divine right of kings <laughs> in how the yeah. rulers are worshipped. Yeah, that's that's another great irony of history, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, making the liberator into a god. And then the thing about uh, history, too, is because you forget a lot of the smaller bad stuff that people did, a lot of times a name gets greater over time because you remember more of the good and less of the bad. So, uh, mm. yeah, who is it? Kim Il-sung was the original yeah. dictator. He was the first. Yeah, and he's and still Kim supposed to be considered the spiritual leader of the country. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's worked out pretty well for Kim Jong-un. He actually looks physically very similar to his grandfather. Mm -hmm. So he's actually gone out of his way to play that up, to try to shore up his legitimacy. Do you think he's tried that as a part of his aesthetic strategy? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. You can see it very clearly in the, the way he presents himself in media. You know, a lot of the propaganda the government has produced has explicitly mirrored old, older propaganda from Kim Il-sung's time. Mm -hmm. So the way he's shot, you know, by cameras and whatnot, and, you know, his photographs and other media, it directly references Kim Il-sung propaganda from the 1950s, 60s. So they go out of their way to try to play up that physical similarity there. So interesting. It looks like a bad movie set. <laughs> yeah, this is a... I don't know if Vox made this. Actually, they did, yeah. It's got other people behind it. There's a picture of Trump behind uh, Kim Jong-un. Chad was saying that uh, Trump is caught on videotape hot miking, saying that Kim Jong-un speaks and his people sit up in attention. I want my people to do the same. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Wow. People were not amused. Yeah. It's interesting the the pull of power for some people, how they like the ability to make other people do stuff. Oh yeah. That's their bag. You wanna know one of the things that you always see, almost always see anyway in North Korean propaganda? Huh. If you look in the background, you'll generally see generals for the North Korean army just kinda hanging around. Kim Jong-un. Yeah. And what you'll see is they almost always have notepads in their hands. Pin and notepad, specifically. And uh, this is something that they have done in North Korean propaganda from the start. They've been doing it for more than half a cent, however long it's been since they've been in power, like 70 years. Uh, they always have these generals holding notepads and pen so that they can take notes on what the dear leader is saying and doing. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, we have one on screen. I found just a random image, Kim Il-sung propaganda, and there's a shitload of generals and a woman with a notepad. <laughs> Jeez. Yep, look at all these people looking and smiling at the amazing leader. Hmm. Everyone looks so happy, too. Oh, yeah, they live in paradise on Earth. Why wouldn't they be? Yeah. Chat saying, have we talked about Haiti today yet? No, I don't think so. We talked about them last week. Have there been any updates? No, no updates. Uh, I think, well, we did talk about the president resigning, right? Uh, yes, we did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's been the only big thing. There have been some negotiations involving the U.S. government about a successor, but there's no clear successor yet, so that hasn't gone anywhere. Mm. So, yeah, no, no change. Overall, the trajectory is still very negative. Gotcha. Yeah, so still complete chaos. Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Back to the feudal system of whichever gang is the strongest is the leader. <laughs> Let's see here, but we've only got about 10 minutes, yeah. so just real quick, I'm going to go through some other things on Ukraine that are worth mentioning here. Uh, you're probably familiar with the aid drama. The United States has not delivered any new aid to Ukraine since December, I believe. And the last authorization of aid was from October, I believe. So. Uh, no aid has been sent, and uh, there is an aid bill in Congress uh, that Congress has been debating incessantly, but it hasn't gone anywhere. So I think it might be worth it to kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, so the bill in question, I think, is about $60 billion in its current form. And uh, most of it is not just transfers of money to Ukraine or even really stuff to Ukraine. Uh, most of it is actually investments in the defense industrial base in the United States. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of stuff in that bill that is designed to increase the productive capacity uh, of the United States so that it can produce more weapons, you know, artillery shells, uh, planes, you know, other stuff that we need as well as Ukraine. So it's not just aid for Ukraine. It's actually an investment in the United States. Uh, and so it's, it's an investment we should have made before, really. So it's mm. in our benefit to pass this. <clears throat> it's eminently advantageous. Uh, the fact that a lot of the stuff we're going to produce with the capacity we build with this money will go to Ukraine is kind of beside the point. Like this, this is something we should do regardless of Ukraine. And it's something people in the military have wanted for a while, but had not been able to get Washington to sign off on until the drama in Ukraine. So one of the things that might happen here, and I'm almost surprised they haven't done it yet, is they might just say, publicly that the Ukraine bill is dead and that we're just not going to send more aid. And then kind of on the low down, just low key say, oh, by the way, we're also going to pass this bill that's going to invest in our own industrial base. Don't mm -hmm. worry about it. Nobody can, you know, nobody's going to contest it. Like nobody will pay attention to that. And it has a much higher chance of getting by. You know, the isolationist crowd can pretend that it's an investment in the United States that would have gone to Ukraine and then they can crow about you know, beating the inter internationalists or whatever. Mm. So that could be what they end up doing in order to try to get around opposition. Uh, but they haven't gotten to that point yet, because right now uh, the approach that proponents of aid to Ukraine are taking is to try to use what's called a discharge petition. So, you know, right now, one of the problems with the aid bill is that uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Mr. Johnson, is not allowing it to come up for a vote because there's, you know, a decent chance it could pass on its own merit. However, there is a way to get a vote on the floor of the House without the Speaker of the House organizing it, and that's via discharge petition. If you can get a majority of uh, House reps to sign on to your petition, uh, then the Speaker has to allow a vote on whatever it is you're petitioning to vote on. So this could allow a vote to happen and get the bill passed. However, this is U.S. politics, so there's always a catch. So in this case, the catch is that there's two different discharge petitions circulating right now. And as you might guess, one is Republican and one is Democrat. Mm. So the Republican petition includes a lot of money 
uh, and a lot of additional money that's going to go towards things like border security, uh, which is, of course, controversial for Democrats. It also includes a lot of additional aid to Israel, uh, which had originally been part of the bill in an earlier form. So between additional aid to Israel, uh, as well as to border security, a lot of Democrats say that they're not going to sign that petition. They prefer to sign their own petition, which does not include these things and is instead uh, more of just a straight aid bill to Ukraine. So whether or not uh, one or the other of these bills can get enough signatures is the open question right now, or if maybe a new discharge petition can be designed uh, that represents a compromise. Uh, that's where the debate is right now in Congress. And from what I've read, there's very little optimism uh, that this is going to pan out. You know, hypothetically, it could work, but right now there's just too much disagreement about what type of bill and what should be included in it uh, in order to get enough people to sign on to any given petition to try to force this vote to happen. Uh, so in all likelihood, this approach to dealing with the problem, given where the debate is now in Congress, is not going to work. So if there is eventually going to be aid sent to Ukraine from the United States, uh, it's going to happen probably some other way. That's how it looks right now, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah, there was some minor news on this front. Uh, the Biden administration basically found $300 million. Uh, you know, the United States government has bought a lot of stuff you know, from the defense industry over the past two years. Uh, correspondent, you know, to replace inventory uh, that was transferred to Ukraine. And uh, when the U.S. government does that, when it buys stuff from the defense base, it gets rebates. So the rebates for a lot of the stuff it's bought over the past 10 years kind of was received back just recently in the past few months. And there's about $300 million worth of these rebates. So what the Biden administration decided to do is commit these rebates to aid to Ukraine. <clears throat> So there's a little bit of relief that'll cover maybe a couple weeks of operations uh, for Ukraine, but it's not much. Like it's just a very small, inadequate band-aid overall. Like they really do need the larger bill uh, to pass in order for significant amounts of aid to really resume. Mm -hmm. But the Biden administration is trying. You know, there is still an effort there, so it's something. Chatter wants to know three good books that you would recommend nonfiction off the top of your head. Off the top of my head? Yeah. Um, okay, let's do this. Uh, doesn't need course, to be perfect. Of course my brain doesn't want to work when I actually get asked. If it were unprompted, I would have more answers. Well, you recommended me American Nations, so we'll do that as one. <clears throat> American Nations is one. Um, About Face would definitely be another one that's still a favorite. I'm trying to remember the author's name. Oh, sorry. At any other time, I would be able to remember it. About Face, okay. David Hackworth, that's what it was. He was the most decorated soldier in the history of the Army. And he wrote a really cool book about his time in the military. He fought in uh, World War II when he was like 15. He lied about his age to get in. And so he kind of snuck in in like 45, right at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. He fought in Korea and he fought in Vietnam. And uh, he ended up basically getting kicked out of the service because he got increasingly, he became increasingly critical of the war and specifically of the leadership. Uh, he's not a hippie. He's not like some, you know, anti-war guy. Again, this is a guy who was like career army. You mm -hmm. know, he was all about the U.S. military. Uh, and he knew he was really good at his job. And, uh, he was in the army during a very important transitory period where it was transitioning from more of an informal approach to management to a more scientific approach to management. Basically, uh, the army professionalized after World War II. You know, before it was more networks and much more informal. Afterwards, they started trying to apply scientific methods of management to professionalize the officer corps and also to rationalize the organization. And uh, that transition was very rough and imperfect, as his account uh, will reveal. So, and, I mean, and there's a lot of other stuff in there, lots of anecdotes, lots of commentary about the nature of war, just lots of insights. It's a really cool read, and it's well written so that it flows very well. Like, high recommendation. About Face, The Odyssey of an American Warrior by David Hackworth. That's what it is. 
So that, um, American Nations is good. Uh, what's another good one? Oh, actually, all right, hang on. Let me get it off my nightstand. He has a physical copy nearby. He's going to retrieve it, ladies and gentlemen. We are just rounding out tonight's episode of World Discussion with Agent Smith, looking at three nonfiction books he would recommend. I have the links in the chat. One of them is About Face by David Hackworth. The other one is American Nations by... It's around here somewhere. Colin Woodard. Your book recommendation right. is The Power Broker. Oh. Power Broker? That's what Fuzzy Cord recommends. Robert A. Caro. Published in 1975. I'm blanking out, but I do have a specific book in mind. It was actually about China. Okay. I'm actually looking at my history of orders on Amazon to figure out what this is. Oh, actually, The Iron Wall, Israel in the Arab World. That's a recommend. I haven't finished it yet, but that's also very good. That's a history of basically Israeli foreign policy up until uh, I think the aughts, mm -hmm. maybe, or the 90s when it was written. So I've been learning a lot from that. Nice. OK. China, no, not that. Oh, Trading Freedom was very good as well, actually. That was written by Norwood Dale. Hmm. I guess this is not off the top of my head at this point. <laughs> Let's see, that was good, that was good. I'm gonna find it. It's been a, I guess it's been a couple years since I read it. No, not that, I haven't started that one yet. I've got a whole stack of books scattered around my room. And sometimes I'll get really into them and finish them, but most of the time I'll read through a couple chapters find it really interesting and then kind of move to something else. Do you need a bookcase? A bookcase? Yeah. Bookcases are for the weak, Neuro. What? All right. Real men have giant stacks of books on their nightstand <laughs> on a giant metal <laughs> rack that you just keep next to your computer table. OK. You just have books surrounding you. OK. This is That's good. That's what it is. OK, I found it. To Change China, Western Advisors in China by Jonathan Spence. That's what it was. To okay. change China. That was very good because that's not actually history of Western advisors in China. It's actually a history of Western involvement in China. And it's told very anecdotally. Each chapter tells the story of a specific person uh, who was, I mean, Western, yes, but more specifically what they were doing and what kind of influence they had in China. And they actually start with Matteo Ricci who was a, uh, I think he was a Jesuit. He was a missionary, basically. Hmm. And he was one of the first Westerners to travel to China and stay there in the employ of the Chinese government. And so his insight and his experience there uh, kind of really reveals the Western perspective of China. And that's an ongoing theme throughout the book, you know, Western perspectives of China, as well as Chinese perspectives of the West. Mm -hmm. And it's a very cool book in that regard. And it just gives you an idea of the kind of continuity that there is in Chinese culture, even up to the present, as well as uh, just how resistant China has been to actual Western influence. You know, people talk about how China doesn't have any culture because it was destroyed, you know, by the Cultural Revolution or by Western imperialism. That's not true. Like, they, they've been very resistant to all kinds of influence. You know, China does whatever the fuck China wants. That's one of the main takeaways you'll get from this book. Hmm. So highly recommend, very cool. And it's not that long either. So it's a pretty short, easy read. Nice. I would recommend How the Mind Works by Steven Pinker. That's a really good one for breaking down evolutionary psychology. 
kind of the short version of what we understand with brain science of how human brains develop to be so strong and how they work, like how they decode our environment, how you um, make decisions in social situations and stuff. A lot of our cognitive bias is baked in there and it's all written for a lay person. So that's really good for a short form, learn about the brain. <clears throat> and then another one that is really strong for any gamer is the mental game of poker. You don't even need to be a poker player to benefit from this one. It basically breaks down the different types of tilt and how those things could upset you and what you would do to frame the situation logically. And normally when you get into the logic and the numbers of anything, you tend to get less emotional and mad because you have information for your intelligent mind to work with. So a lot of people, they'll lose at poker or in a video game and they'll get very mad because they feel bad that they lost and they'll find emotional reasons for that. So what this author, uh, Jared Tendler is his name, would recommend is injecting logic by focusing on what you could have done in the situation and how you could have refined your play. Even if you wouldn't have necessarily won, you could have still improved and iterated on your own actions. And that tends to take the pressure off of you uh, hating on your uh, teammates and more so bringing the focus back to what is my craft, what is my process of learning and incrementally improving at this. So that was a book that really helped me a lot <clears throat> for uh, managing different poker losses because poker losses to me feel kind of similar to Dota or other MOBA losses where your teammates and the enemy players are kind of like the deal of cards on the table and you can only do so much with that. Like there are certain hands where you're just going to have to fold even if you think yourself a very fast and clever person, just the situation doesn't behoove itself to playing it out and expecting to win. So yeah, mental game of poker, very good. And then another one that I feel like the world uh, could benefit from learning about is The Better Angels of Our Nature, another Steven Pinker book. He's a very optimistic sciencey guy. And this book is looking at the historical and prehistoric um, violence per person and how we have grown to be more compassionate to more people and we have been advancing in just how we grant freedoms to other people and other creatures and so on. And just generally how we're nicer than we have been in the past, <clears throat> even if now we get to see violence in HD with all these like <clears throat> war videos and stuff that everyone gets posted. A lot of people feel like the current era is very violent when in reality it's way less violent per person and he goes through a lot of the math and statistics and then also a lot of the cultural norms that have changed over time. Like uh, I mentioned the gentleman's duel was something that was respected at one point in time of like, oh, like he offended you greatly and you're gonna go duel him at sunrise. Okay, that makes sense. Whereas nowadays, if someone says that, you're like, what are you doing? You're insane. That's super barbaric and stupid. Like just play cards or something, like have an argument, <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> Whereas back then there were a lot of violent options that were respected and seen as good options. Um, what is his name? Uh, Andrew Jackson has entered the chat. Oh God. Loose cannon president. We think of like Trump being a loose cannon. He's very soft, at least with how he treats other people uh, physically compared to Andrew Jackson, who's just like <laughs> fucking murderous cowboy, boom, 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 just whatever. <laughs> so we are in relatively more peaceful times. So. Uh, better angels of our nature for a little pick me up that life is now safer and better than it was in the past. Uh, mental game of poker to not be butt mad in gaming. And then uh, how the mind works for just a general brain science breakdown. Those would be my three. Well, cool. Very cool. Thank you for your uh, recommendations. Yeah. Chat has also given some recommendations in the chat. Uh, Wisdom of Insecurity by Alan Watts from Broken Helix. Uh, Fuzzy Cord uh, mentioned one earlier that was what Power Broker? Yeah, the Power Broker by Robert Caro and chat or anyone in YouTube comments. If you want to give any book suggestions, feel free to do so. There are quite a few readers around. But thank you, Agent Smith, for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Uh, as always, if we have any mistakes in this broadcast, please leave us a scathing review in the YouTube comments and we'll try to correct that as soon as possible. Agent Smith, I give you your normal challenge, 20 minute walk, five push-ups, five squats, do your best. Appreciate Very you. Well. Challenge accepted. And we will see you on the next episode of World Discussion with Agent Smith. Smith. Yep. Thanks again, much appreciated. Always a privilege, talk to you next time. GG.